good evening to all of you and the women's cell and the department of english vadobazar bikram tutu memorial college located in purulia west bengal india welcome you to this a week long international level faculty development program on gender sensitization now before moving to the sessions of this fourth day i am requesting all the participants listening on youtube live to remember a few points and at the same time i, I am overwhelmed to witness such a huge response on your side and please don't ask for the assignment from from the very beginning please note that if you want to ask any question to any speaker during the ftp please send those to the whatsapp number that i will mention and i have already mentioned quite a few number of times and assignments based on the topics of the presentation will be given to the participants daily and they must have to submit the assignments within 12 hours kindly remember it within 12 hours you have to submit it it means you all have to submit that assignment max to max um, at 10 am up to more and e certificates will only be awarded to those participants who will submit assignments every day and complete all necessary formality now i hope that you all have enjoyed yesterday's sessions and i'm sure that today also we all will be enriched and also will get to know the picture of south asia and india in general and at the same time the picture of america so today we have with us three eminent speakers namely dr sharoni ghoshal mondol from nit goa a professor sunita murmu from dinda upadhyay gorakhpur university and professor nandini shahu director of school of foreign languages and professor of english so taking a cue from dr boni zara's talk on yesterday we can say that black women in america are triply burdened from racial sexual and class prejudices they are forced to occupy a very marginal space in a male dominated america which makes them feel insignificant faceless subservient and devoid of identity the responsibility of giving them back their rejected humanity and their uh, womanhood falls on the soldiers of black women writers who can be labeled as black womanist writers alice worker is one of those pioneers who believe in the black womanist movement with larger ambits of perspectives that include both literary and socio cultural perspectives the novel color purple is a subtle proof of socio political forces that always move on from individuals pursuit of self identity into projects of national identity and today our very first invited speaker dr sharoni ghoshal mondol will again make us remember how women are in crisis in the color purple now before leaving this virtual platform to sharoni di yes i used to call her di i mean dr sharoni ghoshal mondol let me introduce her briefly Dr. Sharoni Ghoshal Mondol is an associate professor of English in the Department of Humanities and Sciences and Dean Interinstitutional Relations and Alumni Affairs a PRO at National Institute of of Technology Goa in She is the author of a pioneering book entitled Poetry and Poetics of Walt Whitman and Sri Aurobindo She has also co-edited two books entitled Indian Responses to Shakespeare and New Ways in English Literature by James Cox. Her areas of interest include comparative literature, mysticism, applied linguistics and soft skills development. She has presented papers on comparative mysticism and applied linguistics at different universities of the US and Asia. She has also collaborated in a UGC funded project under E Patshala. She has received a major disc sit grant to write a monograph on vedantic mysticism and sufism now i am requesting dr ghoshal to begin her, her talk okay good evening uh, thank you gautam for a wonderful introduction uh, good evening one and all present over here on this e platform 
So before I start my presentation, I would like to thank Gautam and the entire team of uh, BTM College Purulia for inviting me to share my views on gender issues. So my presentation is entitled, uh, The Women in Crisis in Color Purple, wherein I will focus on the areas like gender bias and the exploitation of black women. The Color Purple depicts the suffering of Afro-American community. Alice Walker, as we all know, belongs to a peasant family. Her parents were sharecroppers. Her roots bear the stamp of slavery and subjugation. And her father was virtually beaten down physically and spiritually by social injustice. Her mother walked in the fields, sewed clothes, made quills, and cultivated vegetables. In fact, the protagonist in the novel, Silly, imbibes all, her, all the qualities of her mother. The critical framework of my presentation is uh, womanism, I mean, primarily womanism, but I shall also discuss black feminism as womanism is a part of it, and it is a special contribution by Alice Walker in Gender Studies. Black feminism deals with the plight of women of color, or in short, WOC. In fact, in the second half of the 19th century, Maria Stuart, Anna Julia Cooper, and Sojourner Truth had voiced against slavery, racism, and sexism, but they did not call themselves feminist. The first wave of black feminism thus focused on suffrage and material independence which is similar to that of Woolf's argument in The Three Guineas, which was published in 1938, where Virginia Woolf argues that it is a prime necessity to elevate the status of women in any society. She also argues that women should be allowed to uh, take part in the stock exchange, should be allowed to preach sermons, and at the same time, they should be permitted to write letters to the press. So, and then again in uh, 1949, we have Simon de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, which was again a strong voice of protest against the stifling patriarchy. And then the second wave lasted from 1960 to 1980. The publication of Betty Friedan's The Feminist Mystique in 1963 changed the contour of the movement. The focus was more on the general unhappiness of American women issues like reproductive rights, domestic violence, workplace safety, and rape brought into the discussion. And women also wanted to dive, uh, explore diverse career opportunities. They, do not, they did not wish to be teachers or nurse or secretaries anymore. Whereas the black feminists of that time, the women of color, like Bell Hooks, Shiri Muraga, and Maxine Kingston, fought for social equality, legal rights, cultural equality, and abolition of discrimination. So here lies the difference between the mainstream feminism and the black feminism. So black feminists were more radical than the feminists of mainstream. So we can say in a nutshell that black feminism depicts the experience of black women. It tries to understand their position in relation to sex, class oppression, and racism. Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 aptly said, uh, with co uh, within quote, it is being black and being female. Then we have third waves and fourth waves. So the third wave began in the early 90s and continued till 2010. And from 2010, the fourth wave of feminism began. So the third and the fourth waves taken together can be considered as post-feminism. And as we all know that the post-feminism was officially started by Alice Walker's daughter, Rebecca Walker, in 1992. The post-feminism recognizes the male contribution, and it is noted as a significant policy for gaining full, society, I mean, full societal commitment to gender equality. We can also term it pro-feminism as well does not displace men, rather it has a broader perspective leading to a balance in the heteronormative setup. So that is also the message of womanism. 
now i will move on to my slides is it visible the slides yes it's visible it's visible okay is it full screen now yes it's in full screen now okay thank you so the my main presentation is entitled women in crisis in the colored purple now these are the objectives of my presentation perspectives on women in the 21st century so that first point to be delineated then introduction to color purple black feminism and womanism then i'll talk about Uh, the characters in the novel they are all in crisis and then the final message of the novel and then conclusion so this is a case study this has been taken from unorganized sector so you see the basic minimum wage for a daily wage worker is rupees 305 and the maximum wage can be 325 because the rupees 20 include Uh, esi and the ps that is health benefit and your provident fund now what we see in 2000 i mean in uh, uh, 2020 2020 so because this was collected on 11th july this month shama enterprise arnim junction madgaon goa so the job description mentions sorting and grinding of different types of scraps now what you see here unskilled male worker gets 325 to 550 rupees for 8 hours of work whereas an unskilled female worker gets 250 rupees for 8 hours now you see the gap pay gap and the public perception the proprietor told me that women are support staff they are considered to be support staff they support the income of the family and men should be paid more because he is the bread earner of the family now this is a public perception so it may happen that woman is single the woman can be widow or the woman is abandoned by his by her husband so in that case the woman becomes the bread earner if the woman is abandoned by her husband with kids then now we i mean even if we talk about uh, i mean feminine uh, i mean uh, talk about all these in seminars and all but in reality the scenario hasn't changed much then we have another case study it is from the organized sector and it happened in bbc so here what you see a tri eyed ofra winfrey reflected on her struggles with unequal pay while accepting the hollywood reporter's empowerment award in her speech she recounted an incident from her days working at a news station in baltimore where she was denied the same pay as her male male co, co anchor and what she said i was told that because i was a single woman who didn't have a mortgage and i didn't have kids so that's why i was not entitled to earn the same kind of money as the man who was sitting next to me doing the same thing she said adding that her employers undervalued her ofra said she was paid Twenty-two thousand dollar per year as an anchor, while her male co-anchor made fifty thousand dollars per year. Now you see the gap. Now this is not the first time Ofra has spoken out about the gender pay gap. When Ofra finally got a raise for working on the Ofra Winfrey show in the nineteen nineties, she negotiated higher wages for all the women who worked with her. Now. this is my request to all the women when there is such discrimination let us question let us negotiate i can share a personal anecdote like way back in 2008 i was looking for job and i got a position as a corporate trainer at pinnacle infotech that's an american company and the head office is in atlanta of course the ceo was an indian and when i went there to collect my documents and to sign on the contract i saw that i was on the contract pay band not on the regular pay band so when i asked the asked i mean when i wanted to know the reason behind it i was told whether i had any liabilities or not 
But being a girl from a so, uh, small town, I'm from Shantini Ketan, so I didn't know the meaning of liabilities, honestly. And then they asked whether I have kids or not, whether my husband works or not. Then I said, yes, I'm a childless woman, but my husband works with Bishabharati Central University. And then they said, as you don't have any liability, so you will uh, get, I mean, you will receive consolidated pay. The next day I left the job because I could not, I mean, I could not bear with the humiliation. But this is the perception and this perception will go on. Then another case, it's from the matrimonial advertisement. And here, if, if you see, you'll be shocked. A young man, an industrialist is looking for a bride. And what is he writing there? That the woman has to be attracted aspiration below 26 years of age and she should be a non-smoker non-feminist good cook and never been married before or having any kid so the main lay a lot of conditions on us so why should we have all these conditions laid on us for what reason now you see another example where a woman is looking for a groom and she is not putting any condition on the man and there is the difference. So when a woman is looking for a groom, the language is gender neutral. And if you go to the previous one, you see it's a sexist language. I mean, why should we have to be all the time attractive, good cook, housekeeper? Why? We never question. We accept those matrimonial advertisements. Now, I'll come to my presentation. I wanted to share the perspectives because the program is entitled Gender Sensitization. So, I mean, that's why I thought that I should start with a prologue. Oh. <clears throat> now, The Color Purple, which was published in 1982, is an epistolary novel, which won Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and the National Book Award for Fiction in 1983. And it also received raving reviews across the world. Now, black feminism, the black feminist tradition grows not out of other movements, but out of the condition of being both black and a woman. It is a long tradition which resists easy definition and is characterized by its multidimensional approach to liberation. Now, Alice Walker's The Colored Purple explores the struggle of black women who rise to power and acquire a subjective voice of their own through a series of blows at home and outside the home. Indeed, it is a story of Sil's rebirth into a new consciousness. She becomes a spiritually awakened being from a suffering moral entity who had always considered herself a sinner for no fault of her own. In fact, all the major and minor female characters like Silly, Nettie, Shag, Kate, Sophia and Squig acquire a voice of their own through suffering and exploitation. And gradually they form a strong bonding to overturn the politics of patriarchal family dynamics, where women are meant to be beaten. Sophia tells Silly, Sophia is Silly's daughter-in-law. She says, he don't want a wife, he want a dog. The expression is an evidence of their growing awareness, which Sophia speaks out with clarity and boldness. In spite of offering a very pessimistic picture of black community, the novel ends on a happy note. The narrator is the conflict of gender at the end. We witness a kind of reconciliation between Celie and her husband. It may appear to be quite absurd to the readers that despite the abuses and physical torture, the protagonist forgives her ruthless husband and returns to her family from Memphis. Silly's final message in the novel is family reunion, which is being celebrated on 4th July. The metaphor of reunion is an indication of Walker's theory of womanism. She had coined the term in her seminal work entitled In Search of Our Mother's Garden, Woman is Prose in 1983. The concept of womanism challenges the assumption of feminism, which deals with the problems and difficulties faced by the white women. On the contrary, woman is inclusive in nature 
as it focuses on the dual aspects of black men and women. According to Walker, the vision of a black feminist is all encompassing. She embraces, within quote, the wholeness of an entire people, male and female, unquote. So we may say that it is more of a reaction to white feminism, which addresses only the issues of white women. Womanism does not consider masculinity a potential threat. In the contemporary Afro-American society, black males were the victims of racial discrimination like their female counterparts. The novelist therefore takes the broader perspective and urges for a healthy family environment without any sexual oppression. The black woman's suffering is double-aged, racial discrimination and sexual oppression. Alice Walker's womanism is a response to both. She envisions a woman who is empowered to counter these social evils with a message of black solidarity, which of, co of course, a residue of Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s. Lloyd Tyson, in her book Critical Theory Today, argues that Afro-American literature focuses mainly on the socio-political and economic circumstances that women live in. She also points out that Alice Walker has represented three types of women. The suspended woman, who are weak and submissive. The assimilated woman, who looks for acceptance in white society. And then we have the emergent woman. The emergent woman is vocal than the other two categories and speaks for herself. So Celie evolves to the emergent category from the submissive one by virtue of her progressive awareness over the span of almost three decades. Keeping this in mind, this presentation seeks to analyze Celie's journey of emancipation from an earthly inferno to paradise of love, paradise of love, union, and harmony, which fulfills her womanist quest of independence and contentment within the matrix of family. The narrative progresses through a series of undated letters written by Silly to God and Neti. Neti is her sister. And that establishes the authenticity of their collective voices. It also offers a sense of spontaneity in spite of overall errant narrative structure. Silly writes to God secretly about her varied experiences of suffering in a very submissive tone. The act of writing letters to God is a means of coping with unwanted early pregnancy, followed by a loveless marriage with a widower with three children. Her letters to God amounts to a kind of pathological experience. The narratology is story as well as dialogic in nature, which reminds us of Bakhtin's polyphony. Each of the female voices has its perspective. Silly often quotes in her letters the dialogues exchanged by the other female characters. All the major and minor female voices do not contradict with, with the larger interest of the author. For example, Shag believes in material independence. Neti desires to acquire knowledge. The plurality of consciousness helps Silly to strengthen her position in the oppressive setup. As Silly, uh, grows into maturity, her tone slowly changes from submissive to subversive. Silly's progressive awareness of her individualistic self offers coherence despite its errant structure. It's a Bildungsroman portraying the journey of an impoverished man who becomes an entrepreneur despite her psychosexual harassment and poverty. Apparently, she appears to be a meek housewife who does not protest against any form of sexual, physical, and psychological abuses. However, there is an undertone of protest, which is evident in her letters, where she addresses her husband, Mr. Dash. She doesn't write the name Albert. This may be explained as a submissive strategy of revolt against her husband. Mr. Albert, who is just like any other male representing the stifling patriarchal values without any gesture of empathy. 
the gender denoting term mr is enough for silly to address him as there lies the politics of power and lack of it meanwhile shag avery a singer and her husband's ex enters the scene her temporary refuge in silly's house upturns the politics of power her very presence introduces the metaphor of subversion shag values material independence over anything under the sun She epitomizes the principles of the first wave of mainstream feminism by Virginia Woolf as explained in Three Guineas. You will admit from your own experience that to depend upon a profession is a less odious form of slavery than to depend upon a father. Recall the joy with which you received your first guinea for your first brief and the deep breath of freedom that you drew. it is quite true as any form of creativity needs freedom and independence in the dynamics of gender politics the creativity of a woman is stifled as it offers a cascading threat to the male counterparts leading to an imbalance of power structure of oppressor vis-a-vis oppressed along with shag sofia neti squeak kate form a choric voice to withstand the vulnerability of women in the household kate the sister in law visits her brother and she requests him to buy silly some clothes now you see the conversation between them what kate says you got to fight them silly i can't do it for you afterwards sophia the daughter in law also urges silly to protest you ought to bash mr mr albert's head open think about heaven later in both the examples we witness a rebellious tone they exhort silly to come out of her usual submissive appearance to strike a blow to the age old patriarchal order silly is yet to speak out for herself shag finally breaks silly's silence through an unconditional gesture of love according to charles proudfit shag provides a holding environment and she also works as an auxiliary ego for silly shag's presence in silly's life is a turning point as she serves both as a mother figure and an object of gratification resulting in a secret lesbian relationship which is linked with the broader question of black emancipation shag provides her an emotionally secured and supportive environment to grow into a more conscious being she urges silly to attend her music show silly's husband immediately says Wives don't go to places like that. Her stepson Harpo says it is just scandalous. Woman with five children hanging out in a juke joint in night at night. In response to such patriarchal comments to protect the in response to such patriarchal comments to protect the virtue of a woman, Shag proclaims a woman need a little fun once in a while. she is instrumental to silly's socio psychological development and spiritual awakening shag makes silly aware of her own sexuality she silly sees her image for the first time in the mirror after shag's inst- uh, instruction this creates a sense of self in her and she starts admiring herself all these years she was not even conscious about her subjective self and the looks the consensual lesbian relationship makes silly emotionally secured and makes her feel very special because none praises her physical attributes except for shag so together silly and shag demonstrate a model of sexual and mutual dependence Mary Colavol defines lesbianism as a means of self expression to eradicate mill dependency whereas albert's interaction with sally reflects the matrix of power dynamics 
where Silly is reduced to almost nothingness. When Silly announces that she is going to accompany Shark to Memphis, Albert gets furious and snubs with all his meanness. Just let us have a look at the dialogues. What Albert says, it's very shocking. You ugly, you skinny, you shape funny. Fit to do in Memphis is to be Shark's maid. You not that good cook, good a cook either. Maybe somebody let you work on the railroad. Hire yourself out to farm. You poor, you ugly, you nothing at all. Albert thinks that he can hold back Silly within the four walls of the household by breaking her confidence. He is in need of an unpaid maid. By now, suffering has made Silly assertive. She is no longer going to accept that. No longer going to accept that, and she shouts back with equal force, "I curse you! Until you write by me, everything you touch will crumble." However, Silly herself is surprised by her newly discovered power of articulation. She thinks it comes from the trees. The metaphor of trees is a very striking expression, as it is an ancient symbol of physical and spiritual nourishment, fertility, and endurance. Silly, like an ancient tree, endures all sorts of pain and injury inflicted upon her. Still, she is alive, and she says that she is still there, like a tree firmly rooted and providing supporting supportive environment to all, irrespective of any prejudices and reservation. Albert cannot really chide her by saying that she is just nothing. Her final emancipation takes place in Memphis, where she starts teaching trousers with Shag's social psychological support. Shag says, "You, not my maid. I didn't bring you to Memphis to be that. I brought you here to love you and help you get on your feet." With Shag's encouragement, Silly becomes an entrepreneur with her startup business in the dining room of the house. "You making your living, Silly?" Shag says. "Girl, you on your way." Silly then. Mentions the address of her shop in the letter to Nettie, and she stops addressing to God anymore. So there is a change in Silly. By then, along with her economic independence, she is transformed into an enlightened being. By virtue of Shag's company, she learns that God is everywhere. Shag instills the principles of American transcendentalism in Silly. The movement focused on individuals' perception of God. The principal thinkers like Thoreau and Emerson had spoken of realizing God in solitude and nature. Before the arrival of Shag, Silly harbors a notion that God is a male entity, and she should be liberated from the shackles of oppression in death. She tells Sophia, within quote, "This life soon be over; heaven last always." Unquote. It is somewhat her passive acceptance of life, like a traditional God-fearing woman. Peter K. Powers describes it as a masochistic notion of God. At another point, Silly utters that God is her husband. Powers further quotes Rosemary Rother's argument that the notion of masculine God uh, derives from the politics of societal hierarchy. Man has the direct contact with the masculine notion of God, maybe the Christ, who is supposed to be the savior. The salvation lies in death. Candice M. Jenkins explains Silly's submissive attitude during the pre-Memphis days as a kind of salvation. She conforms to patriarchal ideals and accepts the tyrannical behavior of her husband just to maintain the sobriety of black household. The attitude was common among the middle-class Afro-American women. The color purple, also now we'll go to the uh, color symbol. The color purple also symbolizes liberation or freedom. 
Silly thinks of stitching pair of trousers for Sophia with one leg red and another purple. One can also notice a change in Silly's language during her Memphis and post-Memphis days. It is coherent and confident. She returns to her family as a new woman. What she says, I smoke when I want to talk to God. I smoke when I want to make love. Lately, I feel like me and God make love. Just find out how, whether I smoke refer or not. So this is also the transcendentalist idea of God, that God can be felt. I mean, God is manifested in every aspect of this creation and he, is, he can be found anywhere and everywhere. So Silly's rebellious words indicate her economic and spiritual emancipation. She speaks for herself and she's also aware of the fact that God is not someone to be institutionalized. The essence of the divine can be felt at every moment if one is open to receive the bliss. It's a new age spirituality which is against the customs and rituals. It is more of a private and intuitive realization. Also like Shag, Sili becomes a part of the larger economy. Powers aptly quotes the comments from Margaret Walsh and Laren Berland, who finds Sili's journey towards emancipation is like a fairy tale. Ugly duckling becomes swan. She takes her business a step forward and proclaims boldly with quote, within quote, I tried to work on some new pants. I'm trying to make for pregnant woman, women, unquote. This may be considered as her effort to emancipate her race. The metaphor of carrying woman traditionally indicates domesticity and lack of movement beyond the private sphere. She starts the second phase of her life as an entrepreneur after becoming a mother-in-law. So pregnancy and raising kids do not mean an end of a fulfilling life. It is a phase wherein woman tests the glory of motherhood. The novelist also vouches for womanism, which accepts the life of a woman as a whole, the daughter, the wife, the mother, and the career. The metaphor ends, blurs the dichotomy between the private and the public. The movement becomes easy in trousers. The woman is no more an angel in the house. Silly's final liberation from all the imposed socio psychological bondage takes place on 4th July. This is the day of American independence. Walker deliberately concludes her narration on this day suggesting another level of liberation when the black community strengthens its internal solidarity in family reunion, which symbolically projects their collective independence in domestic space that includes both men and women. It is an alternative vision of freedom through womanism. It is also striking to highlight that Sally does not write her name at the end of the concluding letter. She signs a man. The message of the novel is the ultimate human achievement is not in the individualism. Individual human significance manifests itself in the development of human community. And that is why you can see the use of us instead of I or you. Silly, of course, acquires a voice of her own by virtue of Shark's assistance, Kate, Sophia, and Shag form a choric voice to liberate Sally from the yoke of oppression. So the message of the novelist at the end addresses the universality of God and human relations. Amen literally means let it be so, which recognizes the concluding note of family reunion alluding to harmony, love, mutual respect, and trust. So at the end, I would like to say that Alice Walker is asking both men and women stand shoulder to shoulder to end oppression. I believe is that the parents should be sensitized first. The parents must not give Barbie dolls to the girl child and cars and guns to the boy child. Let us envision a balance. And here I also mentioned the color pink. So pink is meant for girls. 
and bold shades are meant for boys and if you see the word babies it is the gender neutral term and the parents should inculcate the values in the child parents should not stereotype them then we have other references like um, from the book of genesis and the metaphor of lajja gauri and jawala satyakam's story so what we see in the book of genesis the first chapter where it is mentioned that uh, eve was created out of adam's rib and the last sentence of the one of book of genesis it is written they become one flesh so it means they are complementary to one another so where is the question of superiority where is the question of inferiority where is the question of politics of power and then we have the metaphor of lajja gauri she is uh, a symbol of creative principle she is cosmic feminine ma farm and the vedic seers had known the importance of women in society they didn't try to subjugate women like us i mean like what ha is happening in the 21st century then we have another reference jawala satyakam story from chandaga upanishad it is in the sam veda so what happens jabala is a single mother and when satyakam asks jabala about the identity of his father jabala says i don't know i had walked at different places and meet and i lived so i don't know who is your father and nowhere in chandogya upanishad in sam veda satyakam is stigmatized satyakam is not called illegitimate son or bastard so the ancient society was quite progressive than the 21st century i would say so my final message is that parents should be sensitized first as uh, professor niladri had already mentioned yesterday that it should start at home the child should not be uh, oriented to uh, this kind of patriarchy and matriarchy and then my final thing is that why to go for disharmony so let us talk of harmony not disharmony we have to remember that the child should be liberated first from the clutch of patriarchy so that we can dream of a balance so we can we should envision a stage a post patriarchal stage where we i mean this is my favorite quote kavka and toril moy that i will be a post feminist in post patriarchy thank you gautam yes thanks a lot for your wonderful presentation now um, so many questions are there let me take a few from those hope i didn't exceed time no no, no. Just... yes okay. yes yes, yes. Uh, what is your comment on albert as a victim of patriarchy as well Albert was a victim of patriarchy I agree but it, I mean he was more of a victim of racial hatred so that is why the women of the family it's a actually on the part of the womanist because they wanted to stand against the uh, I mean stand against the stifling power of white society so that's why they needed the help of the men but so finally she makes uh, albert understand and that is why the final message is uh, family reunion so that is alice worker's message that men should come forward let us have a balanced healthy hated, i mean balanced healthy society and that is the message of post feminism and that's why we have pro feminists like you professor niladri you are also giving us a platform yes so i mean men's contribution is a necessity in yes. the uh, because with their power we will try to subjugate other men with their help <laughs> okay uh, it is saying that alice worker was criticized a lot by black community for this novel what is your take on it initially it was a very shocking novel for 
everyone and the second thing is that she was mainly criticized for this new doctrine of womanism and in the recent interview say three months ago there was an interview from Gayatri Sprivak she also mentioned that that she doesn't believe in the doctrine of womanism it's not as a whole womanism post-feminism these are yet to be accepted the mainstream feminist activists they are not ready to club these ideas under the broad canon of feminism. That's a problem. So whenever I talk about post-feminism or womanism, people raise their eyebrows. <laughs> okay. Then, um, does workers' concept of womanism include black men suffering or it's more focused on black sisterhood? Nay, it includes black men suffering. Can I just read out a quote? I yes, have something. Please. Okay. Barbara Smith, in her essay, Towards a Black Feminist Criticism, explains, Feminism is the political theory that struggles to free all women, women of color, working class women, poor women, disabled women, lesbians, old as well as white, economically privileged, heterosexual women, anything less than this vision of a total freedom is not feminism. So black feminism is inclusive. That's why I wrote in one slide in blue color that it is inclusive. So black wanted to embrace all, but the mainstream didn't want to embrace them initially. And that is why in the first wave of black feminism, Cooper, Sojourner Truth and Maria Stewart, they did not call themselves feminists, but they fought a lot, the lot. I mean, if you read their suffering, I mean, it will bring tears to your eyes. In this context, uh, there is a question also that to what extent black feminism can be considered a criticism against the mainstream feminism like liberal feminism? They didn't criticize it openly they wanted to include everything because they wanted to be included wanted to be included in the mainstream so that way that criticism was i mean it's i cannot say criticism because they were always inclusive because they wanted to survive the afro american community wanted to survive with dignity in the us so that is why they have a broader vision and they were more inclusive but the mainstream if you see in india dalit the cases of Dalit feminism, it was not included initially. Why? So similar, I mean, sometimes you find a lot of uh, similarities between the Dalit feminism and the womanism. I mean, the black, not womanism, black feminism. Yes. That is there. Yeah. Hmm. And then there is another question that is, uh, why elderly people compare if a child born with black color as dark and a child born with white as the moon? So how can we eradicate this color discrimination in family system, not only in India, but ever where it is happening? Why people give importance only for color complexion and why they don't see qualities of a person? As John Kidd says that truth is beauty and beauty is truth. Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. We know it. Now, in my previous, I mean, I mean, I have been uh, delivering talks on these issues. So in my previous Kerala, I was telling the same thing that the elderly women, elderly men of the family to be sensitized first because they instill these values and then this advertisement, matrimonial advertisements, so the elderly people, the parents, not exactly parents, the grandparents should be sensitized first. So, but we don't have that kind of platform. So here we are discussing this among the academicians, college teachers, university teachers. But where are the elderly people? I mean, I would request, Gautam, if you can just organize another webinar, which is open for all, because it should start in the family. It should start in the family and at some point we have to stop it because color doesn't matter. Color doesn't matter. Consciousness matters. Yes, that is. Yes. So we need to have a good platform to break those 
values. And then this color also plays a crucial role in the marriage market. Why? If woman is beautiful, attractive, I mean, uh, she will get a focus, she will get a lot of grooms. So men, the men should marry a woman of color, I would say. Men should not run after an attractive woman. This is my answer. This elderly generation should be sensitized. Yes. I mean, um, okay. and we have well, already started this kind uh, of yes, yes, slogan yes. in Kerala. Slogan, Kerala. Okay, from when or uh, what time period does womanism begin to influence black literature? Does it influence black literature written by men? And what are its characteristics and how it is different from other kind of feminism? Black and the approach of black feminists are very radical. Very radical because their suffering was different. They were doubly colonized. And they, I mean, and all the time, I mean, the sexism, racism, then hatred, all these were there. And the organized movement, I can say that from 1960s to 70s, but I had already mentioned that in the uh, second half of the 19th century, the women mainly took the lead role, that three women they took the lead role when the men were writing. So it was not into the discussion much. So in the second half, when the three women, the trio, I call them. So I just right now, I just don't remember the date exactly. It was mentioned. I mean, sorry, I forgot. I mean, uh, he can write to me so that I can explain it. I mean, I have your, I mean, you have my mail ID, so you can share my mail ID. So, so, I mean, uh, know where we study this, uh, Julia Cooper, Sojourner Truth, and uh, Anna Jupiter, Maria Stewart, and Sojourner Truth. They should be taught in the syllabus. Now it's right time. And it's high time. So that we will have a better understanding. And the organized one started from the 1960s and the 70s. But the women initially had started it. Oh, okay. The next question is, uh, what was the impact of the new term Womanism in the mainstream feminism? Mainstream is yet to accept that. Rebecca Walker is yet to get a foothold. Rebecca Walker, Alice Walker's daughter, uh, she is fighting a lot for this. 19, uh, she started it officially in 1992, but yet to be accepted in the mainstream. Because nobody, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Okay, I, it's a uh, public platform, but still I'm saying that if it is accepted, then the institute, it will be a threat to the institution, institution, fem, yeah, uh, uh, feminist studies. Okay. You can tell that when parents come from similar social conditioning, how can they come out of it? When parents are there from the same institution, how can they teach their, uh, their children to think differently? We have to take because initiative. I have already started this initiative in my institute at my household. So we have to take that is why I said, why can't we have an webinar for elderly people? Because gender sensitization is a must for them. Because all the time I have grown up in a family where I have seen that the I mean the male cousins will get um, they are, they were privileged all the time they were all the time privileged so I so uh, we have to I mean we have we can write see an MHRD as well yes, because it is the charity begins at home exactly institution I mean that. Uh, the value is already I mean, instilled in us. That's a problem to break it, to deconstruct it is a very difficult job, very difficult. And even if you, when you fill up a form on any online portal, all the time it writes, uh, asks for your father's name or husband's name. Why? Yes, that's. So, and matrimonials, it should be stopped. We have online sites and all there. They can chat. They can find partners. I hate to see these matrimonial columns in the newspaper. It's still very prevalent and dowry. Why are the parents paying dowry in South India? I know the southern context. 70 lakhs, 80 lakhs dowry. 
the parents of a daughter should not pay this much of amount they should stay they should say no and, and in kerala advertisement of fair and lovely and all we should also stop that fair and lovely yes. advertisement and all some creams are there to to make us fair how can we say that and when we are dictating that uh, it is the cream to make someone fair it means we are accepting the that he or she is dark yes so yes yes yes, yes 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 i fully agree with you i fully agree with you and we are doing but i mean i am not i haven't got a good number of uh, friends with me or supporters so gautam is there now together we can start yes 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 and the dowry another... is something it has to be stopped yes there is another question uh, when you rightly talks about the gender stereotyping how is our education system working towards its deconstruction and we see majority of the things mentioned as a part of our educational system so what will be the role of educational system in this context we have to inform the ncrt and the second thing is that barbie dolls kids you go to a shopping mall kids section there girls and boys differentiated in uh, textbooks also differentiated dress codes and all so we have to i mean we have to raise our voice we have to raise our voice otherwise it is it is so ingrained it is in our blood it is in our psyche i feel that and it is i mean do we really use gender neutral language in the classroom let us ask this question to ourselves we have to use gender neutral language like i mean if you have seen my first slide i don't write chairman i write chairperson for nurse we have to write male attendant we should not write air hostess flight attendant flight attendant gender neutral word so we have to pinpoint this and we have to change the text we have to change the language the vocabulary so we have to take initiative like i mean from tomorrow onwards let us make it a point that we will use gender neutral uh, language gender neutral words there are okay. a lot of examples like this so we have to be conscious okay okay this is a question that identity politics is often criticized for being divisive instead of being a uniting force what would be your suggestions regarding dealing with such criticism regarding uh, the could, identity politics ha huh? could you please repeat uh, the I, uh, yes identity politics is often criticized for being divisive instead of being a uniting force what would be your suggestions regarding dealing with such such kind such kind of uh, uh, more more critical approach what will be your critical approach on it when we are trying to uh, deal with some kind of identity politics uh it is for all or it is for academicians who will be the takers of it for identity politics because common men the mass are ignorant the mass is totally ignorant about it now in in the academics among the students if we have to deal with this identity politics issue now i mean we can stop using like um, stop using gender denoting terms for identity like we can stop i mean i i mean you you must have seen that i always write sarani i do not write miss or misses so this primary identity why should i focus my primary identity that mrs or ms so i always write sarani so this is one way of looking at it and then if you see again i have to go refer to professor niladri's talk yesterday that these things are very difficult and these are there it's very difficult to deal with but it requires time it requires time to address the issues of identity politics and that this tussle will always i mean tussle is there and it will always be there unless there is a mass voice to stop this identity politics i mean and then the society also we have to think of a society which is neither matriarchal neither patriarchal so that's why my last sentence was that 
I'm a um, post feminist in post patriarchy. Let us remove all these isms. Let, let us remove all these institutions. It was not there in the ancient time, in the Vedic era. In Vedic era, marriage was not there. Marriage was introduced later. You know what? It's all because of politics, identity politics, and also identity of family, actually. If your first wife fails to give you a male child, then who will carry the identity of the family? Right. And that is why polygamy was introduced. So that the second wife will give you male child. If second wife fails to give you male child, then your third wife will give you the male child. So it was introduced at the later Vedic period. So it's all politics. Who will carry the legacy of family? A woman is uh, not entitled to carry the legacy of a family. Again, identity. The male child carries the identity. So we need to read scriptures as well. And we need to bring them into the present discussion. Because, I mean, it all started long back. So oh, we are talking about feminism, we are talking about post-feminism, but that's why I uh, brought in uh, the reference to Jabala. Jabala was a single mother. And she said at one point that she slept with so many men, so she doesn't know who is the father. Can we really accept that? That a woman will be stigmatized in the 21st century in my community where I stay in Goa? If I can't write my uh, offspring's father's name in the school register, everyone will question me. So oh, everywhere this politics is playing and Kate Millet is, I mean, Kate Millet has uh, organized it and he she put it forward for the mass audience, but it is something we need to have a strong voice. We need to join hands, shoulder to shoulder. We stand shoulder to shoulder. Okay. See, there are so many questions. People are telling that it's it's one of the most wonderful sessions they, they are attending, and so many questions are there. And the comments that there, it's full of question and full of praise. And there is another question between black uh, feminism and Dalit feminism, which huh. is in B, which is in better position in theory and practice. Which is in better position or better position? Better, which is in better position. Dalit, Dalit, Dalit. Yes, exactly. because if you, I mean, I have, I mean, uh, the person who has asked the question, it is my uh, suggestion to uh, to him to watch three movies by Shyam Benegal. One is Ankur, second is Nishant, and the third one I forgot the name. It's a trilogy, and you see, you see, and then you ask. I mean, I mean, it will prick your conscience. I mean, you won't be able to hold back your tears. The plight of Dalit women is so pathetic, so pathetic. And we are not doing anything. We are not doing anything for them. It's not enough. We do you ever find any black, I mean, sorry, Dalit scholar is uh, speaking except for Urmila Pawar? I mean, she was there. So they are, they, I mean, other than they were backed up by many, I mean, many, but. Otherwise, in Goa, in Bengal, in Shantini Ketan, there are many Dalit uh, females. And who, who are listening to them? Nobody. Nobody. Yes, Tribal communities are there. Yes. It is a, there is another question. Yeah. Why uh, should... So many questions are there. And they are all uh, because... Because just one, one, one yeah. thing. You can yeah. you share my mail ID. So <laughs> I can be with... I mean, I can be in touch with them. No, Not an okay. issue. I am you, I am taking two more questions more. Okay, okay. okay. Because I'm worried why, about the next speaker. Yes, yes, she is already there. Uh, why should any woman change her surname after marriage? Identity crisis and any new pet name would be given to the daughter-in-law also. What is your take on it? Acha. Can I share my own experience? Here yes. and after that, I will answer. So my maiden surname is Mandal. And my father-in-law was extremely angry because it is an identity crisis on their part, not on my part. Let me take Freudian term castration threat. Honestly. So what they said, no, you have to use our surname. But I didn't want to. Uh, I mean, I wanted to uh, keep my maiden surname just as a tribute to my parents because 
I mean, how can I forget their contribution in my life? So that is why I have two surnames, Ghoshal and Mandal. So I could do this in 2000. Three. I got married in 2003. Now in 2020, please don't accept the surname from your husband's family. Please don't accept. I mean, we. I mean, these are very small things, but these are also examples of politics, patriarchal politics, patriarchal power structure. Stop using your husband's surname. Please do that. So I had no option because all my documents are registered with that surname. So that's why I don't have any option. So that's why I have double surnames. The second one, my maiden surname to pay tribute to my parents and Ghoshal, my husband's, my father-in-law's choice. Okay. So there are ways, there are ways, mechanism to deal with this situation, but raise your voice. Raise your voice. Don't think that you are alone. God is with you. Yes, and 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 there is another question. I think that uh, in the present context of India, decolonization of the mind is first required before gender sensitization. Oh, yes, yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, I don't. I mean, both are required. Both are equally important. Both are very fundamental. I agree. Okay, and uh, do you uh, not think that we must also stop entertain those bridal Makeup also? Of Bridal course, makeup. of course. And there is another advertisement for that, uh, an advertisement of an FMCG product. So I wrote a letter to uh, HUL, Hindustan Unilever, that Katrina Kaif's Arm Sutra. So, what is the necessity of showing Katrina Kaif for uh, marketing a, I mean, a fruit juice? Why? The second thing is that I'm always without makeup. So, don't put makeup. Say no to this industry. Say no to the cosmetologist. What is the what is wrong to show up our face? We should have that confidence. I never. I mean, I, I'm against this because I should be happy with whatever I uh, received from my parents. And uh, what term can be used for a society which is neither matriarchal nor patriarchal? Uh, let us think of it. Uh, let us say equality <laughs> yes or gender neutral something gender gender neutral it. society very good thank yes, you gender Gautam. neutral society yes and uh, gender in, neutral society yes one last question for it uh, in our experience of teaching gender to students in a semi urban college we mm -hmm. have often found girls learn the gender neutral first and better than boys. Don't you think there should be more camp organized only for boys as well as gender neutral camp? Of course, boys should be sensitized first. Boys should be sensitized first. Being a chairperson of anti-sexual harassment, I receive complaints. At least there will be three complaints every week. And I see how their imagination runs wild and how do they perceive their classmates. Yes, and women are sufferers, so that's why they absorb more. And harassment, teasing, if teasing is rampant, where is Adam teasing? Give me one example. Yes, there is. So the the whole talk um, somewhat confirms to the fact that, uh, like the black women writers who have been urging men not so much to come down and fight but they want them to come down and talk work no, side by side and... oh, just, talk. Sorry. Uh -huh. so thus uh, it inspires some kind of manifestation of female oppression or um, like the black women writers who are optimistic as their narratives conclude on a positive reconstruction of a female self within the structure of the family and community and in the same way your talk also creates that kind of aura of where we should decolonize our mind first and then we should think about this kind of gender sensitization. And taking this at our, as our point of departure, I would like to propose a hearty vote of thanks to you for gracing today's evening in this illustrious way and delivering today's inaugural address. Thank you, Dr. Mondol. Oh.
for this very interesting and thought provoking address and for setting the tone of of this evening i am sure that all the participants have taken note of your suggestions observations ideas and i am sure that they will be discussing this uh, among themselves and they will certainly do something uh, for opening a new ground for gender neutral society and a new ground uh, to uh, different kind of scholarly understanding so thanks a lot thanks for being with us and i hope again we will meet soon when the world yes. w- will be recovered from this kind of covid-19 trauma thanks a lot thanks a lot gautam okay so i sign off yes yes okay yes okay okay so now uh, we are moving to the second speaker in the second uh, session to our talk and uh, uh, it will be chaired by none other than professor sunita murmu who is a professor in the department of english dinda upadhyay gorakhpur university and she specializes specialized in post colonial literatures african writings literature and gender and uh, literature and environment she has co-edited two collections of critical essays representation and resistance essays on post colonial theater and drama and uh, literature of south asia and today she will speak on challenging gender stereotypes in literature and uh, Nuditji, you were there. Now the dais is all you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gautam. First of all, I wish to thank Dr. Chandra Kanta Panda, the patron of your college, uh, Shri Rupa Mahalanobis, convener and head of uh, your college, and of course to you for having given me this opportunity to share some of my views. on this issue of gender sensitization and this is indeed a great pleasure and honor to be part of this fdp online lecture series okay so as you mentioned that uh, the topic that i'm going to speak on is challenging gender stereotypes in literature and considering the fact that uh, this this entire series the lecture series is on gender sensitization i thought a very con- convenient way to get into this topic or to talk about gender sensitization would be by talking about gender stereotypes i was just listening to the uh, discussion so we want to for uh, my lecture and i could see that uh, um some of the questions that you raised uh, have also or i will be taking up some of those questions uh, to the course of Okay, so uh, I would like to uh, share my. I hope you can see the slide. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, it is there. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. It is visible. Okay. 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 So now, uh, to begin with, challenging gender stereotypes. As I mentioned, I felt this was a very convenient way where we could begin talking about uh, gender sensitization. So I thought I should take. gender stereotyping uh, or gender stereotypes as my point of entry into this entire talk about gender sensitization the reason why i wish to talk gender stereotypes is that as individuals living within a society we often interact with family members uh, with people in the neighborhood and within society and as we interact with these different groups of people 
we always seem to try to understand the society around us by forming some mental pictures of people or groups of people around us so it is very important for us that in order to understand the society around us and to understand the social environment around us and uh, to be able to interact with people to be able to negotiate among them we need to form certain ideas certain mental pictures of people around us so the one that we often come across regarding this is the word stereotype where we form certain mental just a certain stereotypical images we form in our minds when we try to understand the people around us now let's look at the uh, etymology, uh, etymology of the word stereotype the word stereotype basically derives from two Greek words stereos meaning form solid and typos meaning impression so that's the word stereotype basically means a solid impression of one or more idea or theory and this term basically comes from the printing trade where there was this metal printing plate and for from where the copies or the duplicate uh, copies were made from this printing so basically how this term basically comes from printing trade now this concept of the stereotype was first introduced into social sciences by Walter Lippmann in 1922 where he used this word to describe the typical picture that comes to the mind when one is thinking about a particular issue so this in fact this is an area which is often very well studied or researched in in the area of social psychology so this is how we see the word stereotype coming into this uh, in the area of social psychology now what exactly are stereotypes let's just uh, define what we mean by stereotypes maybe say uh by stereotypes Uh, your voice is cracking. Ha, huh? yes, your voice is cracking. Yes. Hello. Yes, yes. Uh, I just yes, ha. Uh, this family, in my family, they told me that my voice. Hello. I think there's some network uh, hello. problem. Hello. Yes, 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 yes. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. I can hear you. Yes. Should I go back to the previous slide or uh? Yeah. Should I go back to the previous slide or? Hello. Yes, if possible, if possible. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Hello, hello. You are audible. Hello. Okay. Hello, hello. Yes, yes. Okay. Ha, ha. Hello. Ha. Can okay. you hear me now? Ha, hello. Okay, okay. Yes, I can hear you. You are perfectly audible. Okay. okay. You are perfectly audible. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. just just this just and I'm just, and uh, you can back and you point. can yes and you can switch up your video to improve connectivity you can switch up your video to improve connectivity just a sec actually there's some network problem happening over here network powerpoint hang kar gaya Huh, Just please, please bear with me. Huh? Yeah. Yes, yes. Just. Yes. Hello. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, just, just. Hello, hello. Yes. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Can you can you hear me now? Am I on? Yes, I can. I can. Yes, you. Okay. Uh, yes, you are audible. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. 
just a sec i'll just get my slides up Hello. Uh, I'll just continue in a second. Just let me get my um. Actually, there's some problem with the network. I'll just get back to my um. Oh, yes, yes, we can understand. I'm just sorry for the technical issue. तो आप आपका जो स्लाइड है वो मुझको भेज मुझको भेज दीजिए मैं उसको रन कर दूंगा हां यस जस्ट हां मे बी हां ओके दिस हां जस्ट मे बी आई विल सेंड इट टू यू यस हां ये एप्लीकेशन विंडो में नहीं आ रहा है इट्स अ गौतम कैन यू हेल्प मी इट्स नॉट अपीयरिंग ऑन द एप्लीकेशन विंडो that slide is not appearing you have to open the slide in the okay, background ha yeah. uh, you have to open yes, the slide in the background it is just there it is there somehow ha uh, you can also send the slide to me also by mail and i can also run the slide from here from my end also i can do that okay okay and you can turn off your video to improve your connectivity and you can turn off your video to improve your connectivity okay okay ah uh, it's hard to have but uh, it's getting slow no it's not visible no it's slow that's it uh, maybe i'll send it to you hang kar rahe hai computer hang kar raha hai bar bar hai kam se kam kar ke
ಸೈಕಾಲಜಿ where uh, people study the content. what exactly are stereotypes uh, what do we uh, understand when we say stereotypes of, of somebody some because as i said uh, stereotypes uh, can be of any group of people i need not be just men women and religion certain race any any group so stereotypes are basically cognitive methods they are frameworks they are procedures for processing and interpreting social information so you see so with where where an individual is bombarded with so much of information around him there is a barrage of information around him so one way of uh, understanding uh, uh, in, uh, the groups of people around you or your social environment so you need some cognitive method to just know who exactly he is which gender it could be which community which caste which religion so you to start processing how you basically because you have these stereotypical notions or you have formed certain stereotypes of certain groups of people so you form such so basically it works as a cognitive method so stereotypes are mental pictures and uh, these mental pictures also often need not be very accurate sometimes they are to some extent correct sometimes they are not really and also what these stereotypes are also what we could say uh, what we may say they are preconceived uh, notions of people so they are kind of a in a way they are a kind of a prejudice because you already have formed an opinion beforehand of those people or or groups of people or communities of people whichever uh, group of people that you come across so it could be as they say gender religion caste also these stereotypes tend to be an oversimplified opinion so you have kind of as i said you have tried to put people into a particular category a certain classification so that you understand them, so that you you know how to interact with them or deal with them so you form this or you go by this generalized opinion about this about this group of people so basically it is an assumption about someone which is which could be based on i said nationality as you often also form uh, certain notions of people about who, uh, people who belong to particular nation you know, that's very well known as say by goldsmith oliver goldsmith you have national prejudices where he talks about how we form uh, uh, stereotypes of different nationalities so similarly you have uh, you form opinion or a notion of people who belong to certain religion gender race etc so and these uh, uh, opinions that you form or over so simplified opinions that you form of people generally they uh, they are basically unscientific there's no scientific basis to that you, these are basically unscientific generalization generalizations and usually they grow out of experience so you may have come across that same uh, people individuals belong to a particular group of people over a period of time and you may have drawn or come to a certain conclusion about that and you and these uh, this is also on the basis of certain imitation assumptions because you have seen those groups of people those categories of people performing the same kind of actions over and over again 
for a period of time. So you have more or less drawn a certain conclusion and you have come up with this idea that, that this particular uh, group of people can be called such or can be stereotyped as having these characteristics, having these traits, having these patterns of behavior and having these attitudes. So basically, as I said, you form stereotypes of various groups. Now, what is the cause for concern with stereotypes? What's the problem with stereotypes? Uh, well, that's fine. So it's easy for one to be able to negotiate in a crowd or a group or in society. But the problem with stereotypes is that, that they tend to become fixed ideas and they do not change very easily. It takes a certain time to get over those stereotype ideas about a particular group of people. So these ideas, uh, so these stereotypical ideas of a group of people tend to become fixed. Of course, they do change over a period of time. And interestingly, we find that the change in stereotypes uh, varies of different groups. Now, for example, if we were to take two categories, let's say the feminine stereotype or the masculine stereotype or stereotypes of women or men, let's say, we find that uh, stereotypes of women uh, often or because of the effort put into it to change those notions uh, or uh, effort by that group of people to work through that uh, stereotypical ideas about them, to break them, that gradually people start accepting that change over a period. For example, you see uh, now the recently there were headlines, arms and the women, where you had women breaking barriers in the army. So you had women entering the uh, you know, army force, so uh, entering the army. So you see, uh, is when it comes to, let's say, the uh, male stereotype or masculine stereotypes, we find that it takes a certain period of time for people to accept changes in male stereotypes. Let's say if a man were to take to caring or nurturing or nursing, uh, nursing people, uh, so those involved in health care, it takes some time for people to accept that, that they can equally do such a thing. So you see, it depends and it varies. Uh, this change but the change does come over a certain period of time of course these i'm just giving you very basic examples so that you get an idea as to how the change varies now what the stereotypes also do is that they determine our behavior patterns they determine or they set for us as to how we must behave in a particular manner because uh, once you have a certain stereotypical notion of a particular category let's say the stereotype of a woman. So somewhere there is this expectation. The society expects you to behave in a particular manner. And if you do not fall within the expectations uh, of uh, that group, naturally you may be considered deviant, uh, somebody a little odd, okay? So uh, the problem is that these stereotypes have this impact on the people is that they tend to determine. So you're supposed to conform to certain um, a set of notions about your particular group or category. Then uh, thirdly, what we also find is that they exist both at the individual and collective levels. Because you are not only seen as a member or belonging to a particular group, you also um, are uh, seen as individuals. So this the idea of stereotypes exist both for the individual. That is, you see yourself as also part of a group of people and there is this shared meaning that the individual may also have or possess certain traits which are usually uh, used to describe that particular group so if all women are caring so you may also be caring and you may actually fit into that stereotypical notion that women are generally very caring okay or let's say emotional sense so similarly so applies for male also so you know so you have you may share those traits the individual may share the same traits as that is used to describe a particular uh, group or community. But the problem with uh, stereotypes is again is that it limits and circumscribes one's talent and potential. The problem with the stereotypical ideas about a particular group is that you are not supposed to do this. You cannot do this because this is not your domain. This is a male domain. This is where men uh, work and women are not supposed to do it. So basically there is this class thing that you create that you are not supposed to cross that or break that. So uh, what these stereotypes do, it really applies for the male 
taking leave, or men also that you know, uh, they are not supposed to be taking to household work. Okay. So these are some uh, very basic, uh, of course, at the risk of being generalization. But then, yes, this is how uh, once you form stereotypical ideas of groups of people, what it does is, is that it limits and circumscribes one step and potentiality. Now, now, moving on to the next slide. Uh, next, just next slide. Again, a problem with my. So the next, uh, um, what I want to talk about um, after this, uh, you know, this what why stereotypes uh, is a cause for concern. The next, what we see is what are the effects of stereotypes. What happens when you have these uh, stereotypes, or you formulate such stereotypical notions of a group of people? What, what happens is that rather Yes, B there as is facing some serious technical glitches. So I on behalf of her um, telling you all to be there to keep patience that these are the technical glitches that uh, we have nothing to do with it and uh, what can we do? We are here, we are only think that yes, things will sort out very easily. But that's not the case. Often we have to endure this kind of technical glitches and she is also trying her best to be there and that's the problem i guess she is facing some, some kind of um, several technical glitches and her son is also helping her and she is not able to even send me the ppt via mail so she is facing that kind of poor network issues so i'm so i'm requesting you all to be there to hang with Oh, Hello. Uh, yes, she is there. Uh, okay. Shall I continue? I hope I hear me in the previous. Uh, please continue. Okay. Just I don't need to share the PPT so, again. You just please continue. Uh, uh, because okay, it is okay. not showing also. Uh. Exactly, exactly. Okay, uh -huh. so yeah. what we see the effect of stereotyping? Uh, yes, it is showing. So, uh, uh, the effect of, so what we see the effects of stereotype, uh, the effects of stereotyping that we see is that rather than treating people as individuals, we treat them instead as artificial persons. We don't really take them as an individual. We just see that, okay, they conform to certain traits. So they, you know, so we don't really uh, closely uh, see the individual traits that they may possess. Now, and also what we see then is just an extension of the category that we have constructed. So you see, you do you kind of um, don't value the individual. What his individual preferences are, what his tastes are. You, know, you just said, okay, fine. If they are women, they must be all behaving in a similar manner. If they are men, they must be uh, behaving in a particular manner, or whichever. Groups. Okay. Okay. Now, gender stereotype is a key concern in research with gender, stu uh, gender studies, and uh, this. Genders, the presence of gender stereotyping is very, uh, uh, the presence of gender st stereotyping 
uh, can be seen in key agencies of socialization. Because where do we see this gender stereotyping happen? Where does this take place? And this is a very important area of research within gender studies. Where do these stereotyping take gender stereotyping? So, so it is within the family, it is in the education, uh, I mean in schools, in media, where well, you have TV serials, uh, where you have advertisements, and also within the literature and cultural things. So you see this whole idea of gender stereotyping begins right within the family. Okay, it is the parents, as the child is born, he or she or intersex, which are, or, you know, right from the beginning, they are made to fit into one of the categories, one of the groups. And they are made to do certain things. They are made, or they are made to be more of a uh, socialization and, and how these uh, cultural and social constructs work in making people conform to okay. uh, Similarly, in education, we see that it is in the school, in the classroom, that often these gender stereotyping, uh, you know, uh, begins also when you have boys, uh, or like you know, being made conscious that you know they are boys or girls. Or so these gender stereotyping, uh, uh, this kind of gender stereotyping begins uh, or, or it uh, gets um, uh, it begins here, and it is often in these spaces that uh, um, uh, they are reinforced. Also, they are constructed, they are reinforced, and um, often challenged. Also, it is within these spaces. Yes, again, extremely sorry for the technical glitches that we have nothing to do with it, this kind of technical glitches. But we have to endure with it. So I'm also uh, seeing that in the chat box also, if you were telling that mm, uh, women is, uh, uh, male is he helping women. So yes. To some extent, in this post-feministic era, and the uh, in this kind of condition, we have to be there. We have to help um, each other for a collective betterment, for making the society better. So it is there. We have to be there. And yes, there are some kind of challenges also. That is that is also there. But we must have to. Uh, we are all those challenge and uh, in the literature also we have to deal with all these things so it is there and we have nothing to do with it and uh, story books can really break children's uh, gender stereotypes there i would like to um, tell in this context that um, so many children books are there those can be um, used in the curriculum also. So storybooks really break children's gender stereotypes and the features and the, those characteristics assigned to men and women. Mm, I think let me at first, let me discuss today. Let me take this session. OK, yes, no, oh, no, uh, no, ma'am is there. Mm, actually, the problem is that um, our second speaker is facing a lot of technical glitches. Okay. 
<laughs> so that is the problem i'm still trying whether she will be able to join or not um sunita ji will you be able to continue the talk yes, or yes 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 i am i am I just... okay. can you hear me okay okay yes am yes, i yes. Huh. okay i'll move also fast <laughs> i'm so sorry for this hello so there's a massive network yes. problem today uh, Okay, ha. Huh. Sunita ji is there. Uh, she has again restored the connection, and we have to wait for fifteen minutes till eight, and then uh, yeah, you will begin your talk. Yes. yes, 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 Sunita ji. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Yes, yes. So what we find uh, that uh, the effects of stereotyping is such that we tend to see them as an extension of the category right. that we have constructed. Okay. Now, um, uh, sorry, sorry. I was talking about uh, just. Okay, so and it is also within the literary and the cultural text that we find that these gender stereotypes um, are not only really constructed; they are reinforced. And at the same time, it is within these literary and cultural texts that that they are contested. So you see, the literary and the cultural text becomes a very interesting domain. Where, where you not only find that these stereotypes being constructed, but uh, uh, and reinforced, but also being challenged, countered, and also busted. So the domain of uh, in, uh, let's say the literary culture, a literary um, uh, let's say the domain of literature and culture provides um, you this space where we can uh, counter or kind of challenge these uh, stereotypes. now for be a way of by way of example i have uh, let's say uh, i'm just looking at uh, some of the stereotypes of women however this is not to say that stereotypes of men or other groups uh, do not exist but one of the most common stereotype uh, that we encounter in our cultural and literary texts is that um, of let's say when we look at stereotypes of women is that of the mother uh, where the mother is often presented as uh, you know all loving all embracing she's a nurturer all protecting uh, uh, who, who um, is all sacrificing who shows endurance submission all of this and there's so many examples uh, that you would find be it in bora of andamain be in argenarayan of uh, savitri and various such characters uh, that you so you find that the stereotype of uh, the mother Uh, often uh, glorified or valorized. So uh, this is one uh, stereotype that we often uh, come across. Uh, let's say when it comes to women. Now another very common stereotype we find is that of the wives, uh, and this is there uh, even in Western literature or, or British literature that you've studied. We find often uh, they being presented as portraits of submissiveness, somebody who's passive, devoted to the family, compliant. so these are the um, uh, images or uh, stereotypical uh, images of women that we find and in fact in 19th century uh, there is uh, the angel in the house of uh, hello hello yes please go ahead please go ahead am i audible yes okay okay fine yes 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 okay so you have okay yes i'm getting so uh you you have a um, uh, women as wives as a, a very good uh, i'm uh, i'm one very powerful uh, uh, image of the angel the house in the 19th century victorian and uh, you have a um, uh, commentary back narrative point which um, uh, talks about uh, a very ideal idea of the wife which is probably idealizing his wife uh, emily so uh, so then from where we get this point basically the angel Also, where we get the idea of the angel house. There is of course other people also quote on the tennis and also where uh, you know man for the field, woman for the heart, and all. So what the kind of basically, and so of course the other let's say negative stereotypes are that of the witch, the seductress, uh, the fallen woman. So these are very common stereotypes uh, that you see about uh, women. Um, so as I said, uh, the same applies to men. You have studies where people also. Study how you know, other groups, categories, genders, uh, they have these stereotypes. So now, what is important is that uh, feminist criticism uh, or work in 
institute theories uh, have helped in uh, you know, deconstructing the institute types by you know, pointing out that how women have been represented in the literature, how they have been uh, stereotyped. And uh, uh, they also talk about, uh, you know, they also expose uh, the mechanisms of patriarchy and how these stereotypes work within the structures. So there are a lot of uh, uh, so, uh, so, so, and, and, so there's a whole history of. Hello? So there's a whole history yes, yes. of uh, uh, feminism. So that uh, you know is, that looks at uh, you know, these uh, changes too. and so you have uh, let's say some just to give you a few examples very early on you have mary wollstonecraft in her vindication of the rights of women um, uh, where she is talking about how men uh, see the women as the fair sex somebody who lacks reason and she tries to counter this stereotype by saying that how they should be uh, educated of course she falls into another kind of a, a stereotype because she talks about women passing on uh, sorry mothers passing on this idea to the daughters that how daughters should grow up how they should behave uh, and um, you know uh, what are the ideas that they should imbibe and be good companions of the people so of course that's another stereotype uh, that she kind of creates but the fact is that she raises or points out how women have been perceived by uh, uh, by men or uh, men uh, the, the other examples are uh, work by you know mary elman uh, mary elman To in her uh, various uh, you know, stereotypes of women in her this collection of essays, a book which is a collection of essays. So the other examples, of course, are of J.S. Mill, the subjects of women, which is subjection of women. We are all familiar with all these texts where we basically see a tradition. So it is from feminism, feminist theories, or feminist literature criticism that there is tradition of you know looking at these gender stereotypes. Uh, I mean, uh, stereotypes of women, how these have been challenged. And how they have exposed how a mechanism or patriarchy works. The other examples are again Virginia Woolf. We have the very famous um, her essay, Professions, uh, Professions for Women, where she, she critiques this angel in the house um, idea in Essex, where she feels that she must uh, kill this angel in the house so that uh, she will be free from what society expects of her. Basically, the society's expectations of her being innocent, soft, and uh, <clears throat> Uh, very uh, you know compliant so she wants to break out of these uh, she talks about coming out of the stereotypes only then would a woman be able to write free so when she's talking about her writing she feels the need to break away from this angel in the house uh, uh, image or idea so uh, and uh, so these are of course uh, um, simon du uh, the second sex uh, we are all familiar with where once again uh, she points out how women have always been posited as the other of uh, men and how uh, there is this negative uh, you know uh, uh, stereotyping about uh, women care when they are posited as the other of men so these are various examples basically to see that how there is this tradition where gender stereotypes have been uh, uh, i mean stereotypes of women have been critiqued by so they basically offer you a way as to how we go about uh, uh, critiquing uh, such gender st uh, stereotype. Okay. So, uh, said, uh, said, uh, uh, so not only do they, uh, as I said, uh, not only they talk about how they have been represented, how uh, these have been uh, you know, contested, and also how women have also sometimes internalized these uh, uh, patriarchal uh, ideas so you know all kinds of writing have been explored now let's look at some of the uh, literary examples what are some of the uh, examples in literature that we find where we find that these gender stereotypes have just to give you a few examples uh, you have uh, george Eliot's uh, 19th century work mill on the floss where you have this character Maggie Chamber, and this character you find her that um, you know going against a stereotype type idea of a girl that has been put forth for her by her mother because the mother um, uh, uh, because the mother wants uh, that she should be behaving like her cousin Lucy 
uh, who like a, a very stereotypical girl uh, you know she dresses well she plates her hair very neatly and she this uh, and this is something very uh, the whole idea of following uh, lucy or you know fitting into a particular uh, you know gender norm of behaving like a particular uh, being be a girl like she uh, is absolutely opposed to that and you know that she just goes and chops off her hair and she refuses to do like her and in fact in the entire novel you find her you know, going against a certain social norms certain ideas of marriage and all of that okay uh so so this is just one example of course other examples are the very well known uh, doll's house where you find the character nora breaking the glass ceiling she refuses to finally you know um, uh, uh, you know come to accept the compromise uh, with her husband and just settle or stay back in the house and she chooses to leave the house uh you have also have virginia wolf clarissa dalloway in mrs uh, Cla- in mrs dalloway where you have uh, clarissa while she is talking about or ruminating over her marriage uh, with her husband uh, richard dalloway you also find her that she's kind there's a hint of uh, you know of her relationship with um, not relationship exactly uh, that how she was at one point of her life she was uh, very close to uh, sally seaton and it could have or uh, you know developed into a lesbian rich and in fact several of her works do explore um uh, homosexuality so issues of homosexuality so you see these are several texts uh, which are uh, kind of um uh, uh, you know they break uh, gender stereotypes or they, at least they question similarly you have examples of sashi desh pande uh, novels like that long silence you have vijaya where you were talking about how a woman has to change a name and she you have this character which she, uh, i mean sashi desh pande brings this up that where a woman is made to change her name after marriage and here is this character who basically looks at how you know a uh, patriarchal society was how she's made to conform she must behave in a particular manner uh, she must you know despite knowing uh, what uh, her husband is up to, i mean she can she really cannot protest and of course there are different ways of uh, protest that she brings up in several of in fact, most of her you know she does bring up this idea how women uh, you know break these uh, in, uh, stereotypical ideas of you know a good wife by uh, you know crossing the uh, threshold in the sense like uh, you know, she goes out and has an affair and all of this similarly mahesh tatani uh, very interestingly uh, looks at uh, how gender roles work in his uh, play like dance like a man you have the character jay who wishes to take up dancing and of course what uh, the the problems that he has to go through where his uh, father as well as his wife are not very supportive and they cannot accept and they rather especially the father cannot accept a man taking to you know uh, taking dancing as a hobby and, i mean as a career i mean of course he doesn't mind him pursuing it as a hobby or a passion but uh, uh, he is st- strongly opposed to um, you know, him taking it up as a career and even his wife is not very supportive of the idea because she herself wants to pursue her own dancing career she rather encourages her daughter to pursue her own dancing career but some uh, career but somehow she is not very supportive of her husband and rather she feels that she is not man enough and rather she should not really be and in a way uh, he shouldn't be shouldn't be pursuing uh, this uh, career so ultimately what we find is that uh, the all these uh, literary works what they do is they uh look at uh, the stereotypical uh, you know portrayal of characters and um, they contest so uh, so one of the strategies of um, contesting one of the strategies of challenging gender stereotypes um, uh, is by presenting such characters who are who do not fit into uh, stereotypical um, ideas another strategy that we find that is often used in literature is that of rewritings we often have uh, we have several writers who go back to the old classics because you often have, we also have uh, a myths which kind of create social myths or cultural myths that kind of um, uh, uh, you know set ideas of or create or construct what uh, you know what stereotypical roles should women fit into or kind of uh, 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 that is those ideas imposed on different uh, groups as to how they must uh, behave or they set the norms for behavior so you have writers who go back to such 
cultural texts and uh, they write from different perspectives and so you have a lot of rewritings so especially Mahashita Devi's you find uh, the subaltern uh, uh, stories been written from the subaltern subaltern woman's perspective so also you have Chitra Banerjee Venakuri's uh, Palace of Illusions, where you have the story been written from the perspective of Draupadi. So Draupadi is given a voice, and um, uh, and Panchali in the in the novel. So once uh, again, what you find that these are some of the strategies that writers use to challenge these gender stereotypes uh, or counter counter them or to contest them. So another uh, strategy that again we find in writing is a lot of women writers taken to writing uh, autobiographies. Of course, what I'm giving you are just examples of how you know women stereotypes have been uh, contested uh, in in literary and cultural texts. So autobiographies like Kamla Das's My Story, uh, where you have uh, you know uh, giving you very unconventional ideas. I mean, questioning rather conventional ideas of marriage, love, sexuality, all of these things. So when you have such autobiographical writings, naturally it sets up the reader, sets up the, you know, the audience to, you know, look at, relook at these stereotypical ideas that have been formed about the So similarly, you have Bama Skaroku, Baby Kamblis, The Prisons We Broke. And very interestingly, it is in these autobiographies where you find gender and caste intersecting. And um, uh, because how, uh, so you get also a glimpse of what happens when gender intersects with um, uh, uh, caste. So again, a different very, uh, you know, uh, it breaks somehow this very, you know, uh, uh, general idea about women that one may form. And so rather they make it more complex, the uh, category of women or the idea of women. And th there's so many other, um, you know, perspectives that get added to the common notion of a woman one that one may uh, formulate in society. Now, this is where, uh, after having looked at the several examples as to how uh, literary texts or cultural uh, texts, um, you know, they challenge gender or how it is, how, how these, uh, sorry, these stereotypes are contested. It is um, here that I would like to bring in uh, Judith Butler's criticism of feminist theories. Uh, according to her, what she feels, uh, what she states is that the problem with these feminist theories is that that they do not question the processes that go into the setting up of these gender binaries. The problem, the issues that she takes up with the feminists is that that these fem uh, that these uh, 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 feminist uh, theories or these writings they do not question how the whole category of women is constructed and who constructed, or let's say, is to, is instead of playing into the gender binaries that have been already constructed by a patriarchal setup or a system of domination, just by uh, you know attacking patriarchy or just by attacking the male, uh, they basically kind of play into those uh, gender binaries. So do not do not explore the processes that how these are created. These gender binaries are created. So what they fail to look at is how this is entirely constructed. There's nothing very natural about, you know, that these there being two categories and basically it's a fight between, you know, men opposed to you know, patriarchal order, which is uh, majorly dominated by men. And uh, so, uh, you know, so what happens is that they work just within that uh, gender binaries and they do not see how the binaries itself is constructed and how also they do not uh, how they are uh, not able to see is that how in this case um, uh, heterosexuality is presented as the norm and how when there is just these two gender binaries how uh, heteronormativity is emphasized. So why is it important is because this is where um, uh, you know the scope uh, uh, is widened to include other gender categories, which may not necessarily be men, women, or or the other other gender uh, transgenders or uh, the other uh, groups gender categories. So now uh, let me uh, now go into the area of social psychology. Why social psychology? Because it's social psychologists who basically study stereotype content, 
and they see that um, the, the how gender stereotypes are they see they kind ji, of uh, sunita ji uh, yes. um uh, ha yes time is um, not there so much so i'm um, please requesting you to conclude uh, the session yes i'm almost i'm almost at the end of my uh, lecture yes. uh, uh, okay so let's i just hurry okay so these uh, social psychologists uh, basically they uh, in their uh, research they take up the study of gender stereotypes because um, uh, when they take up the study of gender they basically show that how these stereotypes basically they create a behavioral blueprint they kind of present a certain you know prescriptive and prospect uh, prescriptive way that they kind of provide the scripts where these gender roles you know uh, are performed so basically this again aligns with you know the judith butler ideas of gender as performance so when you have these stereotypes basically they in a way uh, they are like the scripts of a play where the individual just uh, the script remains but that same individual or uh, these the various different individuals who come along they perform the same so you kind of repeat uh, those actions you fit into those actions you do repeat those actions over and over so basically what i wish to say is that a uh, butler's idea uh, of gender performance can be very much seen in how these stereotypes work because in stereotypes what you have is individuals beat men and women they are made to perform the same actions repeatedly uh, uh, according to what they are supposed to be uh, you know the, what is scripted for them so what is important is that it is very important there is this necessity of um, challenging gender why because number one it changes your perception of gender so unless you challenge and i think there are also several examples you will find now uh, uh, efforts are being made even let's say even simple in the media let's say like the advertisements where you have a mother teaching her son as to how he should also be cleaning clothes and it is not just a work of the so he should also be participating in a, in such an activity and which is actually gender neutral it is not gender specific and um, so they counter basically uh, uh, gender specific so already examples we have seen in mahesh tatani who basically takes up uh, that you know a dance need not be uh, only uh, a career that only a woman or it's only meant for women and it can be uh, performed by uh, you know, even so they look at our so they counter these gender specific also when we challenge these gender stereotypes what happens is also it also thus blurs the gender divisions you know you do not have actions saying that if it is cooking it is only a woman who has to be doing it or um, if it is you know earning it is only a man who has to be doing it so when you break these or when you contest this or you show characters or present characters who break these norms what happens is you blur the gender divisions when you show that these actions or these activities do not pertain to any one particular sex or any one particular gender but can be performed by either and there is no compulsion that all because somebody is born male female or whatever intersex they did not have to conform to whatever they are born as with whatever and so or perform those things. so this uh, challenging gender roles also exposes uh, how gender roles have been basically made to appear as natural so this has to be also seen when we counter that how these have been made to us we think that it is a natural that women automatically has to be cared in nurturing and the, the whole idea that this has been fed into us as activities that are very natural to those particular genders this needs to be uh, or this gets exposed when we uh, you know counter stereotypes now coming to the conclusion of uh, my talk um, what we basically see that we have to hence look at what are these agencies of socialization and how can they be instrumental in challenges the gender stereotypes how will they be able to also you know how can we make space or create space for other gender categories those gender categories who do not fall into the boundaries how do can we create space um, uh, uh, apart from creating space how do we make visible the other gender categories so when you contest these two when you just uh, see also that how these binaries are constructed will you be also be able to look at other gender categories and hence move or prepare the ground for greater gender inclusivity and hence also gender inclusivity and hence you would be moving we would be moving towards a more gender balanced world so literally so what ultimately i would like to say since i began with uh, 
the importance of challenging gender stereotypes in literary and cultural texts is that that literature and cultural texts play a very significant role in challenging and deconstructing gender stereotypes and what is important is that uh, there is a need for a new gender inclusive pedagogy so when once when we introduce so if we are teaching a particular text and where which has uh, let's say uh, where we are looking at gender we need to sensitize the students to various um, gender groups various 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 uh, you know uh, different other sexualities Need, need not necessarily be heterosexuality. It can be pointing out to that there when there are characters who do not fit into that, uh, you know, uh, uh, or, or not uh, fit into the categories of, let's say, heterosexuality. So what, what are the other, uh, you know, uh, uh, categories or what are the other sexualities that are explored in that particular? So, in a way, what we basically go on to do is we sensitize the students so it is a kind of a gen so, uh, i mean it is basically a gender sensitization that we do when you teach text keeping in mind or opening up these areas during discussions so you include text where the uh, you know the uh, the category of gender is widened broadened and uh, the students or children, and they should begin right from schools. I mean, right from uh, when a child, boy, boy or girl, just uh, once in school, they should be sensitized to the other gender groups and uh, how they are to deal with it, how they are to, you know, uh, relate to it. So this is, uh, so it is within literature and these cultural texts that we see around us that where this uh, idea of contesting uh, stereotypes, gender stereotypes, can be very effectively done, and we can move towards a more gender inclusive world, and hence a gender balanced world. Thank you. Hello. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, thank yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, thank you. With that, Thanks I come to the end of my lecture. I'm really sorry yes. for the technical uh, glitch. That was really no, had a problem no. In with spite the of that, in spite of that, it was wonderful. And due to time constraint, I'm unable to take the question. But to be honest, oh, your talk oh. can encourage so many kind-hearted people and social workers to set up a gender monitoring network also of civil society organizations to whom one can reach out at regular intervals to gather information on the sure. challenges that women are also facing. So that they can channelize their yeah. voices, they can channelize their thoughts in that way. And so thanks a lot for making us aware of all these facts. And I hope that you will again respond to my call for the sake of academic fraternity and bonding. Till then, stay safe and healthy. Uh, okay, thank you so much. And I would request you to kindly send me some of the questions so I could, you know, yes, uh, I will. On, uh, yes, 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 yes. So I could yes, uh, you know, see what are the questions. For your mail ID also. Would... Yes, please, please. So uh, yes, many questions th are you. there. But thank you know that. Due to time constant, I'm unable to ask. It's, it's a, I, rather, I'm really sorry for having. No, 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 I, no, no, no. It was really the same. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, 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 okay I shall log. Okay. Now I'm uh, going to request our third speaker. So, Professor Nandini Shah is there. But uh, before that, let me uh, welcome her. The, and um, I have a. Um, when uh, she was there and uh, she has given me the consent that yes, she will deliver the talk. Rather, I was uh, so much enthusiastic and what I can say, because I have a long relation with Nandini Shahu ma'am in academically also. And in March 2017, I took her interview also that is published in Epistemy also, where um, she, came, she talk, talked about the liberty of utterance, the emancipation of uh, think. And uh, they are in that interview. Uh, she talked about uh, from um, her eco feminist stances, her thoughts on her concept of poetry, along with other issues that is related to, to feminism also. And um, and I can say that uh, that uh, if, if you all can go through the interview, that I will also paste the link there. You can get a Margaret Atwood in India, and that uh, that interview. Uh, uh, will definitely be an inspirational document not only for women but also for men in general and now um, as we all know about Nandini Shahu and uh, she needs no introduction but uh, still for the uh, for the listeners let me tell you that Professor Nandini Shahu is a major voice in contemporary Indian English literature she has um, she has 
uh, accomplished her doctorate in English literature under the guidance of late Professor Niranjan Mohanty, uh, Professor of English Vishwavarthi Shantinagatun, who was also a renowned Indian uh, male poet writing in English and uh, he, he belonged from Odisha. Uh, Nandini Shahu is a poet and a creative writer of international repute. He has been widely published in India, USA, UK, Africa, and Pakistan. Apart from numerous other literary awards, he is a triple gold medalist in English literature. He has received the gold medal from the Honorable Vice President of India for her contribution to English studies in India in the year 2019. She is the author and editor of 13 books, 14 books under publication. The title, The Other Voice, The Silence, a poetry collection, the post-colonial space, writing the self and the nation. That is a very major book published to, uh, from Atlantic Press. And you all can go through the book to get the idea of a post-colonial uh, Indian identity. And then there is Silver Poems on My Lips, a poetry collection, Folklore and the Alternative Modernism, Volume 1, Folklore and the Alternative Modern. It is volume two, Sukamma and other poems, Subhanalekha and Sita, a poem. Definitely, I will recommend all of you to read Sita, uh, where she deconstructed that image of, of Sita. Uh, Dynamics of Children's Literature, Zero Point, published from New Delhi. Presently, she is the director of School of Foreign Language and Professor of English at Indira Gandhi National Open University, Ignu New Delhi. Professor Sahu has designed academic programs and lectures on folklore and culture studies, children's literature, and academic literature. Um, and American literature for it. Her areas of interest uh, cover Indian literature, new literatures, folklore and culture studies, American literature, children's literature, and critical theory. And she is the chief editor or founding editor of Interdis uh, Interdisciplinary Journal of Literature and Language, IJLL, a biannual peer reviewed journal in English. So I'm not going to tell you more about uh, Professor Nandini Sahu. She is there. I, I will also share the, uh, the link to the Wikipedia page and I will also share my interview also. And now I'm requesting Professor Stahu to deliver uh, her much awaited talk. Yes, you are there. Okay. Thank you, okay. Dr. Gautam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gautam Karmagar yes. for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, oh, I share a very beautiful relationship with Dr. Gautam since long. Uh, he has been taking my interviews and he has published me recently in one of his poetry uh, anthologies published from the yes. Saite Academy. Saite Academy. And, uh, yes, and uh, he has been doing seminal work. I truly appreciate uh, uh, this young and enthusiastic uh, boy, Dr. Gautam Karmakar. I share a very beautiful uh, relationship with him. Thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, very important lecture. Uh, and about about uh, this series, this you know faculty development program that you are conducting about gender sensitization is really important. Uh, our students, our participants, and uh, the researchers today, they need to know uh, more about gender sensitization. It should not remain a theory. Rather, people should learn, learn to practice it. So today, my talk is somehow about uh, practicing uh, gender uh, uh, equality and solidarity. You have invited me to talk about body politics from the uh, from the lens of the so since I poetry books. So uh, I have emailed you one of the poems from uh, my recent poetry collection. This is zero point. Uh, so Dr. Gautam uh, must have emailed that poem to all of you. While yes. I talk about body politics and the literary theory. And uh, uh, also practice, uh, I would be giving some examples from uh, one of the important poems from this collection. Uh, the last poem, it's a very lengthy poem. It was originally published in Ireland, The Song of Liberty. I'll be giving some uh, examples from that poem. And uh, also this morning, I sent uh, a few questions. MCQs and he requested me for the participants. Apart from those uh, MCQs, uh, I have a few more questions for all of us, for you and for me, for all of us, uh, before I go to my topic. 
and you may take down the questions uh, and then you may try to answer those and then you may send those to me or to dr gautam he will forward those to me uh, the, the questions are what is the difference between gender equity and gender equality and women's empowerment before you talk about body politics we should know about gender equity gender equality and women's empowerment and uh, another question uh, of concern for me and for all of us is why is it important to take gender concerns into account in program design and implementation since i am a poet critic and i am a teacher i have been teaching literature since past 20 years so i have been in the uh, uh, you know policy planning committees and also uh, program design committees of quite a few universities including my own university so uh, we all should know why is it important to take gender concerns while it is implementation and uh, another important question for all of us to answer is what is gender mainstreaming is gender a mainstream subject or still it is one of the marginalized subjects for us and uh, a very simple question why gender equality is important for all of us and is gender equality a concern for men also this is most important question in fact uh, that uh, when we talk about feminism we basically we are not talking about women and women's rights and women fighting for other women i don't believe that as a woman i should be fighting for all women rather i believe that there should be solidarity between the three genders men women and the third gender there should be solidarity so um, in the concluding part of my lecture i will be talking about queer theory lgbtq and the studies for related to the lgbtq and also masculinity studies so if you ask me ma'am what do you understand by gender studies then i would say it is three dimensional we have to talk about feminist literary theories feminism we have to talk about masculinity studies and at the same time queer studies lgbtq studies if we are not taking all these three into consideration then probably our study of gender remains incomplete <laughs> so i'll just give you a little bit idea about gender equity gender equity means what fairness of treatment for men and women according to their respective needs so equity has something to do with needs this may include uh, some general treatment uh, like you know treatments of the rights the benefits the obligations and the opportunities given to men and women that is gender equity and then uh, gender equality we all know solidarity equality isn't it and then gender mainstreaming as i asked you what is gender mainstreaming it is also an approach to policy making that takes into account both women's and men's interests and concerns for example when i design an academic program for a university then i should be taking men's and women's interests both of them into consideration in this context you know, i am reminded about uh, uh the class uh, the the school texts of uh, uh some uh, school you know the, the the text the textbooks for children from some school there was a committee where i was the uh, uh invited guest and then i saw that in the textbooks and the illustrations all the boys pictures are that of uh you know uh, archery or playing cricket or playing football and all that and all the girls pictures were that of helping their mother in the kitchen and also there was not a single picture in the book where a dark skinned child is featured or where a child from northeast is featured so i pointed it out since northeast children are not featured in our textbooks sometimes our children tend to think that northeast people are chinese or something like that so you know they should be treated equally and also there should be no gender stereotyping in the textbooks so these things are what we call the gender mainstreaming and uh, it was first introduced this idea was first introduced in the year 1985 in the nairobi world conference on women <clears throat> that there should be gender mainstreaming so with these ideas in your mind in my mind let us get into my topic uh, my topic is very simple body politics from the perspective or from the lens of a creative writer so i would be giving very simple ideas just with a simple poem one of my poems uh, and uh, let us know the difference between body politic and body politics you might have heard these things if you have not heard i would rather uh, uh, ask you or request you to take down the 
points and do some research after this talk about body politic and body politics and you know my lecture is full of information so dear students please take down lot of points and we can discuss those later on after my lecture we can discuss those i do not have a powerpoint to share with you i usually uh, deliver my classes like this uh, so body politic means but it's a socio cultural term body politic you l i t i c not s so body politic is a socio cultural term uh, it implies the the fabric the structure of the state okay and body politics is different from that body politics is a term in feminist theory and today i will be talking more about body politics body politic can be kept aside for another uh, lecture when we can have some social sciences and discussions thereof uh, well uh, the body politic it's a medieval metaphor uh, that compares a nation to a corporation body politic and in western political thought uh, it, it, it's an ancient metaphor by which a state a society and its institutions are conceived as a biological body as a human body so the state is compared to the human body that is body politic but uh, uh, the metaphor implies hierarchical relationship and a division of labor and it carries a strong power structural connotation so the of the power so this i mind politics while reading policies through which powers of society regulate the human body and uh social control of the body uh the powers at play in body politics include institutional power based in the laws disciplinary power extracted in economic production discretionary power exercised in conjunction personal power negotiated in intimate physical relations so in intimate physical relations how body politics plays an important role now you must be having lot of questions in your mind No, that that what has body to do with politics uh you know the term body politics it refers to the practices and policies through which powers of a society regulate the human body and uh, social control of the body the powers at play in body politics include institutional power expressed in law and powers extracted in economic production and uh, personal powers negotiated in intimate physical relationships between men and women between the two genders uh, uh, in the intimate physical relationships in individuals and movements the individuals and the movements they engage in body politics when they try to change that power structure that oppressive power structure uh, of institutional and interpersonal relationships and uh, you know uh, the inferior gender the so called inferior gender in case here uh, especially women uh, they are denied the rights and the control on their own bodies so body politics challenges that and it intends to say that uh, women uh, have the right on their own bodies so feminism has something to do a lot to do in fact with body politics there have been political struggles around the body Uh, in gender and developmental discourse so i will come to the developmental discourse and gender discourse separately and tell how body politics controls both the body has been slowly moving into the heart of political philosophy so now body is not exactly the body that you see that you touch here here body is a metaphor so you know the body has been slowly moving into the very heart of political philosophy theory anthropology and gender discourse and now the most important point here is the personal is political my personal feelings with the feelings with which i wrote uh, that poem and it has been emailed to you that is no more a personal poem that personal poem is actually a political poem so in that poem what i have done i have taken the protagonist a woman in the three stages of her life initially when she was in her tender uh, age maybe she was in her teens or early 20s 
the woman is thrown into uh, a marriage uh, without any understanding of the body or without any sex education without any understanding of her body she is sent to a marriage and then apparently her body is cold and frigid and she is not at all active in the physical intimacy with the other person so here the body plays the politics here the body does what the woman never intended to do and the man drops her in the first part the shadow masochism is there the shadow masochist he drops the woman because she doesn't have the understanding of the body she doesn't have the involvement with the body that is the first part and in the tender age of 18 20 years so that is the protagonist and in the second phase the protagonist the woman she gets into a deeply romantic relationship with a man i put the man within quotation quote on quote man and she is very satisfied emotionally in the relationship but at the same time she is denied the pleasure of the body so the the person with whom the, she has the relationship uh, uh, in the second phase of her life uh, is apparently a gay man whose uh, uh, sexual orientation is different and uh, she has been denied uh, uh, the rights of her body and then when she points it out now at the peak of her youth she points out uh, the fact and the body the bodily needs that plays the politics relationship also comes to an end and then in the third part of her life in the third phase of her life uh, she comes across uh, a character who actually introduces her to her body so she understands body politics she understands the needs and desires of the body and then uh, from her microcosmic from her small macrocosmic world microcosmic world she proceeds to the macrocosmic world and she understand the body of uh, uh, all women of transgenders of the lgbtq of men and women and, and then she thinks beyond the body through the body so that is her body politics and the third phase so that poem has been emailed to you which i would be problematizing and theorizing vizavi the theory called body politics and uh, uh, i hope you are getting my points Uh, body politics it was first used in the this sense in, in this part of as uh, the gender discourse it was introduced in the 1970s uh, during the second wave uh, feminist movement and uh, uh, it started in the united states it arose out of uh, the feminist politics and the abortion debates women who wanted to abort they were not given the right to do so and uh, uh, they tried to rationalize it they tried to give the reason why they are trying to abort uh, and it arose out of the feminist politics and uh, uh, the abortion debates it uh, involved the fight against objectification of the female body <laughs> and violence against women and girls and the campaign for reproductive rights for women so the second wave feminists they argued that women should have complete right on their body and it's the woman who should decide if she wants to abort or to go for the reproduction so with that this body politics debate started in the 1970s and as i already told you that the personal is the political became a slogan of that period and uh, it captured the sense that the domestic contest for equal rights in the home and within sexual relationship are crucial to the struggle for equal rights in the public so what we experience at home what i feel at home how i am treated at home will also be the way how i am treated in the society outside home and this form of body politics emphasized a woman's power and authority on her own body which i have already told you you know many feminists they rejected the practices that draw attention to differences between male and female bodies refusing to shave their legs so you know women uh, in the second wave feminist movement uh, women are uh, declined to shave their legs and underarms to reject uh, cosmetics and uh, revealing clothes they said that we have every right to lead a comfortable life like men lead this reminds me to uh, the objectification of women in our bollywood also you might have seen that if uh, there are some movies some uh, some songs in movies you might have seen uh, that 
there is a snowfall and extreme north maybe in the himalayas or in kashmir the shooting is going on and the men is all clothed the men is the man is wearing coat and you know suit and everything and he is well protected uh, on his body but uh, the female character the protagonist is made to wear a transparent thin uh, chiffon sari so i never understand the logic behind it that why can the women also be allowed to dress up like the man and make herself comfortable in the shooting so body politics uh, 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 challenges these kinds of objectification of women that women should have the right on their own bodies and they should take the decision if they want to uh, uh, present themselves uh, uh, in in a particular way in any specific way so there is a book uh, in published in 1973 our bodies ourselves uh, that book uh, actually talks about that it, it aims to widen and deepen women's knowledge of uh, the uh, workings of the female body it allowed women to be more active uh, to pursue their sexual pleasure so the concept of pleasure pleasure is also a critical theory you know? uh, like body politics uh, women have every right to understand pleasure and their reproductive health so body politics is basically from the social sciences and sciences and slowly it is coming to literature uh, you know uh, the author uh, wendy hair coat she speaks about the concept of body politics and explains how the body is so central but so invisible in the developmental theory the body is so central but so invisible when nobody talks about the body but the body is the central what i have today completely or you have is your body what else do you have and you have every right to uh, uh, to uh, uh, understand and uh, to your needs and your desires and your body and uh, uh, your socio political needs your religious uh, uh, needs everything you have the right to understand and she points out in her book body politics and development uh, published in the year 2009 that the body is a subject of political power and the practices around sexual and reproductive rights and health health not just physical health but mental health but how many people talk about the mental health of women hardly anyone talks and uh, there is gender based violence there is uh, there is maternal health there is sexuality and knowledge around the body so you know body politics takes these things into consideration the physical and the mental health of women the reproductive rights of women gender based violence against women and uh, the health of a mother and the sexuality and knowledge around the body so we should have that understanding you know ill health uh, um, birth of children pain cruelty and pleasure these are the points of debate in that book development displaces that uh, reality is more focused about uh, only the physical health dismissing mental health vis-a-vis -vis sex and reproduction so when a woman is going through a pregnancy those 10 months her mental health is more important than her physical health and body politics talks about that that the, the doctor or, or the family members they have to take equal care of her mental health along with her physical health and uh, treat her mental health also as normal and uh, modernity tradition religion all these have rules around body and often uh, according to sex or sexual orientation uh, uh, women uh, are denied to talk about their body and my lecture aims to challenge these assumed norms of mainstream developmental practices by naming them as well as validating these practices other practices by feminists and the women groups and uh, even women's groups uh, they also talk against these practices uh, unfortunately so and i am forced to call this uh, female patriarchy so patriarchy again is not a limited term uh only men uh, may not be patriarchs uh, uh there are wonderful men who are feminists uh, our uh, look at our dr gautam karmakar he is one big feminist and i so admire him for that and i know that's quite that's a few that's... men who are very very good excellent feminists and uh, there is also female patriarchy so uh, body politics problematizes that female patriarchy and my lecture uses my own experience since i'm talking from the lens of a poet to pull out the various question i want to raise about body politics in gender and development a few of the questions that i wanted to raise i asked you in the beginning itself if we have time we will go to those answers in the end uh, seemingly personal issues associated with the body such as rape marital rape contraception 
hair and clothing styles of women, pregnancy and sexual harassment. Uh, these issues were not traditionally seen as political. They were very personal. There was a time if some domestic violence was going on in somebody's house and a husband would be wife beating, then uh, the neighbors would say, uh, it's between the husband and wife. Unka ghar ka mamla hai, hum kya kar sakte hai? But now, uh, body politics challenges that. Uh, we are told now, we are taught, even I say that to my students and my researchers and everybody, that if there is violence in anybody's house, if you cannot do anything else, at least knock the door. At least ring the doorbell. That can put the first step to check domestic violence. So, you know, now personal is political. Anybody's personal issues related to domestic violence is becoming uh, a political matter of the society, which is a welcome change. Uh, for me, bodies are the, the core of the political order as makers of status and power. Contemporary societies uh, tend to segregate not only the access to political power, but also work, religious life, domestic work, and intimate violence, which is domestic violence according to the sex and dress of the bodies they organize. So violence approves the boundaries of approved sexual relationships and deviations from normative heterosexuality, uh, racial hierarchies and approved modes of masculinity and femininity are punished with harassment, bullying, battering and sexual assault, sexual violence. Bodies are powerful symbols and sources of social power and knowledge production. See, body is a source of knowledge production now. So body is no more just a physical body, but it is the metaphorical body. So, knowledge, so it produces knowledge and uh, it talks about privilege on one hand and subordination and oppression on the other, body politics as a theory. Uh, now I would go to uh, talk, talk little about uh, the National Academy of Sciences, where some bodies, like male bodies, let us say, they are associated with, with authoritative knowledge and enjoy more respect and presumptions of rationality. So National Academy of Science. It has written somewhere that uh, uh, male body are more uh, author they have more authoritative knowledge and the other bodies other mostly female uh, LGBTQ uh, the bodies of the LGBTQ and uh, the classed bodies the racialized bodies they are dismissed as emotional. Many people call women, oh, they are emotional, Unko chodo, they are emotional people. And they are uh, inappropriate for serious pursuit of knowledge. So body politics problematizes this kind of a question. Uh, like in 1993, Judith Butler, she has suggested that the hierarchy of bodies shapes and is shaped by our process of knowledge production. Bodies are not determined by human nature. Physical features uh, of bodies are shaped by the social context. It distorts the nature nurture contradiction. I will, I will repeat the nature nurture contradiction. Popular discussions of science have continued to emphasize the nature culture dichotomy. In the nature culture dichotomy, you all have heard uh, that women are close to nature, uh, so uh, they are less rational than men. This is what is. Uh, believed this in turn has served to justify the continued exclusion of women from the public sphere of politics you can you if you compare you will see very few women come to politics uh, no one talks about how gender interconnects with race and ethnicity sexuality disability uh, age class religion and other categories like abortion very few people talk about AIDS, contraception, population control, and gender appropriate norms, sexual needs, and desires. And uh, we can have uh, rather uh, a post structuralist or a Foucauldian approach to human body. I will come to that Foucauldian approach uh, after five minutes. Uh, much of the history of Western, in, in the Western philosophy, body has been conceptualized simply as a biological object. Uh, problematically, uh, for women, the opposition between mind and body has also been correlated with an opposition between uh, male and female. And uh, the female is regarded as trapped in her bodily experiences through pregnancy, through childbirth, through menstruation. And with the female regarded as she is trapped in her body. And uh, uh, I would 
quote uh, grows uh, the critic uh, from a book in 1994 women are somehow more biological more corporeal and more natural than men so this kind of stereotypes have been assigned on women such corporeality and assumptions uh, require the feminists to confront the sex differences and make uh, gender studies a more uh, interdisciplinary subject today and uh, body politics is a truly interdisciplinary approach to the understanding of the female body feminist theorists are talking about race theories today and uh, they are talking about disability theories and uh, uh, they are talking about gender diversity new areas of research are coming up like living the female body is one area of research i found many uh, phd thesis on that and the people are talking about post radical feminism body practices and uh, and then biology and the new materialism critics are talking about those and the phenomenology a return to phenomenology and the visible identities there should not be invisible identities of women but visible identities and bodily imaginaries people are talking about that and the, the body has come to prominence uh, by the feminist health movement uh and in this context you know uh, uh, i would just give some references from the second sex by simone de beauvoir uh, she theorized about the relation between the body and the self self my mind my heart and my relationship with the body along with other phenomenologists uh, she she recognizes that uh, to be present in the world implies strictly that there exists a body you cannot deny your body isn't it and uh, this is at once a material thing in the world and uh, your body is your point of view towards the world what you do with your body is your point of view towards the world and during covid 19 at least we understand how important it is uh, uh, to to think about the body isn't it and uh, uh, also another phenomenologist like uh, sigmund freud uh, uh, he talked about the corporeality the body constitutes the self that's what he said and it is not a separate entity to which the self stands in relationship uh, body is not simply what biology offers us uh this is uh, body is a lived experience and uh, in the data of biology in another uh, section of uh, this book the second sex uh, simone de beauvoir she problematized the comment there is a comment uh, uh, from uh, a critic that woman is weaker than man she has less muscular strength she can lift less heavy weights when i read that i was reminded of a very recent movie i watched Mm, hindi uh, bollywood movie in fact uh, uh, the the name of the movie is sand ki aag in that i saw that women do all the household work and they go to the farm and they take care of the cattle they take care of agriculture they take care of cooking and the children and everything and men just sit at home and enjoy so when i read the this statement that women is weaker than man in that movie actually i found that women were much more physically powerful than men not just mentally and ultimately i would request you to watch that movie the how women they are the winners so in this context you know i was reminded about simone de beauvoir statement that one is not born but rather becomes a woman she is made a woman since childhood ideas are given to her so this is consistently quoted and living in female body is also another uh, area of research uh, a lot of people are uh, talking about it uh, a girl enters puberty and uh, her body becomes a source of horror and shame we i even i remember uh, attaining puberty the things i was told that is what i have written in that poem uh, that uh, you should not talk about your body you should not talk about the vagina this uh, new growth in her armpits transforms her into a kind of animal she hates her body sometimes the the development in her body and her menstrual blood becomes a source of disgust to her she she gets horrified with the menstrual blood these negative descriptions are continued for sexual initiation marriage and motherhood so she thinks all these things in a very negative in a very problematic way 
that the menstrual cycle uh, the childbirth the pregnancy all these things are a kind of a hush hush affair something uh, to be hidden something to be kept very secretly not to be talked about and uh, these accounts have been a source of criticism particularly when the later feminists the second wave feminists they problematized these questions of uh, uh, the body and that what are the things that a woman should be told about her body and in the absence of which what kind of issues and problems she might face in her life the second wave feminists have talked about this and uh, they criticized it they problematized it and uh, they they thought uh, they uh, requested to celebrate female body enjoy a female body and body politics talks about the celebration of womanhood a woman should be allowed she should be trained to enjoy her body and to celebrate her body and uh, uh, the body should be a source of her pleasure fertility uh reproduction and empowerment having said all that uh, theoretically uh, how i practice this body politics as a poet the poem which has been sent to all of you uh, please look at that poem uh, dr gautam am i allowed to quote a few lines from that poem uh, i will just quote a few lines uh, just go to that poem uh, if you have the poem in front of you uh, yes yes please poem, uh-huh. okay that is please do that okay it's a very long poem as i said the three parts uh, the three phases of uh, the woman's life uh, practicing uh, body politics so uh, the woman says uh, the song of liberty the title the woman says yes i did not have the vagina a mother and a lover though i had been until i became this vagina having vagina speaking woman until i reexamined my existence with the vagina as metaphor with an understated brilliance so she was asked never to talk about the vagina until i went weeks months and years without ever viewing it she has never seen the vagina or knowing its being there mother taught me about its invisibility sister taught me how to place a pad down there yes they are whispering once i menstruated and i turned from a small girl to a gentle lady of course not thinking of it the vagina without ever looking at it they thought they were politically correct about it the vagina it's your dignity girl so vagina becomes the dignity of a girl isn't it i was truly gently worried about this dignity of mine whom i call whom whom i can never see but others can seeing the vagina was such a relative many pronged act i had no sentient bond with it the vagina it was just there down there like the vault it was the room i never visited the dark room of the mind so the vagina is the dark room of the mind not just the body the dark room of the mind closed for convenience other parts of my body echoed each other flooded into each other but the vagina was just a functional vacuity arbitrarily sucking up air as there was nothing else to suck it was the connoisseur like a black animal moving there down there then they made me the seafarer among seafarers like all married women and wished him the man to be the vast sea now i was a married girl after all but as a remnant i was cast off that day that night so here i talk about the marital rapes like skin he tore me off with hunger sweat and thirst i could not sojourn no longer as i marched ahead i left the venerys and illimitable drop in the ceaseless ocean my heart became a cellar like a tree heavy laden with an ovary that i wanted to rock and offer him as if it were my day of building crops in an unremembered time in the history of vagina tales and then in the second in the next stage what happens the woman is frigid and cold so how she is treated by the society by the sadomasochist he grumbled screamed winged about the cold frigid dry lifeless woman most uninviting clogged sexless vaginaless nothing like the women he explored out there he was the chaperon for many never for me i asked him once if flaring my vagina in the operation table would stop him from looking for 
newer pasture grounds that left my audacities black and bruised. But the spiky sharpness won't stick into me those nights because there was no nun vagina. He picked the parts of my body he wanted. No lips, no nun breasts, no neck, no nape, no nun cheeks, just the vagina, the dry like pig vagina and got it swarmy with a dark hot oily greasy liquid got from the local sorcerer for rupees two that burnt me there that spent away my soul the black vial from the local sorcerer got the dry woman wet bloody wet for his convenience the chastity belt broke again and again like that one i had read in hundred years of solitude The black firmament broke. The weaver looked into the unabridged loom but found none. Nothing came out of nothing. So, you know, uh, so body politics is that if you kill the mind of the woman, nothing will come out of the body. Nothing comes out of nothing. He believed in killing the goose that laid a golden egg, like the covetous man in the tale from Ace of Pebbles. I was the way the nomads would be. Vaginaless, still after being sluttered. It lasted till mornings, on and on and on, till finally I was a skeleton, 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 skeleton. No smiling eyes, no chubby cheeks anymore, no more the doll that I was. I was ugly, the ugly duckling, no more the princess charming. I was bruised and battered, not to be celebrated as a woman needs to be. So this is how the woman. Uh, uh, was treated as just as a body and then uh, she became lifeless and then the first part of uh, uh, the vagina game is over and uh, and the woman she gets out of the marriage or rather she is dropped by the man out of uh, the marriage and uh, she becomes uh, alone or she becomes single once again but by that time the woman is uh, pregnant and there was no blood no more on the petticoats and no nun in the white sheets, but she had blood in her eyes and she was home. Then the second part becomes uh, our motherhood. Uh, she says, I became a mother. That is on the page four of the poem. I became a mother. And then she thinks of childbirth when the vagina is not an edgy, erotic hovel yearning for quiet years. Pretty much. It's an archaeological tunnel. So vagina becomes like an archaeological tunnel in the Rameshwaram temple. Think of the inside long corridors, a sanctified bowel, the vagina, an appallingly fighting fit subway with a baby besieged with the barriers, eager to be enlightened, to be free of the snare. So then the protagonist thinks of the mother's vagina. The mother's vagina is like a Catholic inflamed throbbing heart. So she is all forgiving in the second part and then in the third uh, in the second in, in the next phase of her life she gets love that is on the page seven of the poem love love oh love we went to meadows and precincts to revise that it is the inclination of the bee to pleat honey of the flower but it is also the desire of the flower to revenue its honey to the bee no one voiced this knowledge it was dribbled into my ears it's fine to have a vaginalist bonding with a man because you care. So in the second phase, she is declined love uh, and sex. So uh, the second part says love, love, and love, the vaginalist love. But now that I had touched the mountain top, I initiated the climb. And as if I was longing to bring forth honeyed harmony from chaotic echoes, the vagina game had started. The body politics had started. Context was on. And then the vagina song was sung by the character. Mm -hmm. I cannot be deceived anymore. Because denial, sexual denial, according to body politics, after all, is the worst form of sexual violence. So that is what the, the, the character realizes in the second phase of her life. And somehow the vagina -less love comes to an end with the vagina question. And there is dialogue, there is debate, but uh, the, the relationship comes to an end. And uh, the in the third phase, uh, the, the woman, uh, that the protagonist, 
she comes across uh, another character named joy in the city of joy i would quote the poem i ask the eternal question oh dear speak to me of the vaginal truth are mental orgasms any different from the physical ones the veracity of reaching the soul through the body is it an art tell me the truth is an orgasm elusive for me am i asking for too much so this is the question of the protagonist the woman and the man he replies benevolent oh you beautiful woman vagina song is the song of liberty so again this is body politics understanding the body is required oh you beautiful woman vagina song is the song of liberty let me celebrate your body let me adore you old lady so it's not complete sovereignty it's the blooming of your aspiration yes it's not the pot it's the gravity crying into a loftiness through morning but it's neither bottomless or light nor it is opaque the vagina is imprisoned somewhere in the mind the vagina is imprisoned somewhere in the mind it is the mind it is in the mind it won't speak unless the cosmos of the body and the mind are embraced as an organic whole and unless the soul is engaged so you see how the body mind and the soul are engaged together this is what body politics uh, claims uh, uh, that you know an understanding of the mind body and the soul together only leads to the vagina song or the song of liberty the song of entirety so this is in uh, this is what uh, uh, i have talked in this poem and in the last part of the poem uh, these days at leisure i ponder over the vagina of women folk grown up women fledgling women lesbians teachers friends and foes sex workers and brahma kumaris homemakers nuns married women and transgenders i think of the vagina of all of them i feel yes that's true women speak with their bodies it's like a therapy writing this poem is like a therapy uh, of precluding evil mess happening to women who aren't vagina conscious women who are not conscious of their vagina or the body uh, they may have to go through a lot so this sisterhood poem a sisterhood poem is it the vagina bonding poem it's like addressing the torment intangibly in quietness forever finding a way to manifest so i conclude the poem by saying women do not feel like dirt being brow bitten if ever if it is a rape fight fit while talking errantly into task and all the patriarchal thought into task so the advice is desire drink but let no vagina game drink you for sure no feminist thought it is i loath to impose standards of feminism and gender just justice on a fantasy i would rather celebrate the strength and intimacy of women in playing the vagina game as game of power the body politics no black and white game for me please give me all shades of gray gray because vagina conscious i am convinced of my worth in your journey from girl child to teenager to adult let the passion within your depth spare the truth reject the inkling to stay within the confines of gender stereotypes customize your attitude with your tiny little sword the vagina let it be no counter discourse of the penis as the sword do this they are do this while managing to look like feel like an amazonian chiseled dream negotiate your live voice with the vagina truth so women when they understand the vagina truth they will actually understand their body and then their mind so these are uh, the discussions in that poem uh, and uh, when i talked about uh, the the discussions of uh, uh, living the female body the, that text uh, uh, i of simone de beauvoir uh, i gave you the example from this poem when a woman uh, understands her empowerment her fertility and her pleasure and all other sources of her body through the body uh, the way in which the young girls and the women they experience uh, the body it's the, it's the consequence of a process of internalizing the view of a uh, view of it under the gaze of others under male gaze female sexuality should be celebrated for its power and its uh, supposed capacity to es- escape from the structures of dominance and submission and uh, uh, disciplining the body is another issue 
uh, that the body politics problematizes our bodies are trained since our childhood especially when we become young our bodies are trained shaped and impressed with prevailing historical forms of masculinity and femininity uh, regimes of dieting uh, makeup exercise and dress and cosmetic surgery uh, and uh, uh, these things are uh, problematized by uh, body politics women and men are kind of forced with a lot of social pressure to make their bodies perfect hair straightening uh, contract lenses surgical reconstruction of nose and lip and uh, other parts of the body and such practices uh, uh, where uh, bodies are disciplined bodies are reshaped so kind of fiddling with nature playing with nature these things are again problematized by the theory of body politics uh, because uh, bodies need not always remain young and beautiful because uh, uh, mind and uh, soul and your uh, understanding of the society understanding of uh, people and your contribution to the society these things are given more importance uh, by the theory rather than disciplining the body or shaping and reshaping the body and uh, 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 you know from uh, you know there is not a single part of the uh, women's body which is left untouched from head to toe every features of a woman's face every section of her body is subject to modification so a woman should be always beautiful this is what is uh, uh, the, the norm of the society and body politics uh, challenges that and the foucauldian uh, insights claim that such modifications are a consequence of social mm-hmm. meanings and sexual desirability availability or respectability or participation in the social groupings so you know how deep connotations these things have uh, a female slenderness like size 0 it has a wide range of uh, a contradictory meanings sometimes a size zero woman who who struggles a lot to remain so she is struggling with her powerlessness and sometimes uh, this is connected to uh, autonomy and freedom of the woman to shape her body the way she likes so body politics talks about it from both points of view that a woman need not be forced to be to be powerless and remain size zero or uh, slender neither she should be criticized uh for her freedom and her autonomy uh, to remain thin or slender if she likes it and uh, here i am reminded about a term by gayatri chakraborty sivak compulsory able bodiedness compulsory able bodiedness so you know one should not be always able bodied we all have our weak days we all have our weaker times we need not be able bodied all the time so having said all of that as a poet critic and a teacher i have a few suggestions uh, we should not only talk about the ed- education as degrees rather we should talk about the kind of education delivered to us in our universities from my experience uh, in both forms of education in the conventional education as well as distance education uh, i taught in conventional universities for uh, first 8 years of my life and then another 12 13 years i've been teaching in distance education where we design and develop our course material we write our material print and then we take lectures on that from both forms of education from the odl mode uh, uh, i i have seen that uh, women uh, choose subjects like arts education nursing mostly uh, as if uh, uh, the subjects that women choose uh, they have uh, uh, they are just an extension of their domestic roles the domestic roles that we have at home uh, nursing and uh, cooking and cleaning and arts and education women to such subjects and uh, i did a little research on that engineering technology management and computers these subjects um, they have less number of female students so uh, professions like teaching or nursing can be seen as an addition to a women's uh, role at home uh, so uh, you know having seen all that i feel that uh, a uh, courses in women studies should be refreshed now we should give more uh, uh, vocational and empowerment oriented empowerment related courses to women courses on women and law uh, body politics uh, feminist historiography women in politics these kind of uh, things can be introduced in our syllabus of both 
open and distance learning as well as conventional university for a social change and uh, uh, post modernist courses can be there a feminist linguistics can be there in most of our textbook we see that examples are given as he not as she but in igno i am proud to say that if you look at our uh, feminist linguistic course material or most of our course material the examples are always she not exactly he and uh, i would like to conclude by saying that i am a post modernist uh, i am not exactly a modernist but a post modernist because i do, don't identify with melancholy i will not always uh, uh, cry foul and uh, uh, play the sympathy game uh, i think women are slowly empowered women have the understanding of their mind and body that is why we all are talking about body politics today Uh, i guess while writing my poetry i redefine the knowledge from the past i use lot of folklore and culture in my poetry lot of mythology in my poetry and uh, but it is not a restoration of the past experience but a novel creation like dr gautam was talking about my sita so in the text sita i am not brooding or crying over the destiny of sita rather i am talking about uh, a contemporary character sita uh, vis a vis all women who is who is a progressive independent and uh, optimistic positive woman who accepts life as it is she accepts life with all positivity and she is an eco feminist she is an educationist she is a single mother and she is a healer uh, she she is a caregiver she is a mother and she is an educator so this these are the roles that women play and that's why i claim that i am a post modernist rather than a modernist i do not cry foul Uh, uh there is another unfortunate thing that uh, uh, women's absence from the record uh, uh, in the scholarly debates and scholarly uh, texts uh, is something uh, that i really uh, uh, am critical about and feminist linguistics talk about talks about that and uh, uh, it's it's extremely important today that we should introduce it as a compulsory course uh in almost all the courses starting from medical engineering to humanities and social sciences and sciences feminist linguistics should be a part of it and uh, excluding men uh from uh, feminism is not a good idea uh, so masculinity studies is very very important and men should be equally a part of uh, feminist studies and uh, also eco feminism as a subject should be introduced ecology and women have deep connection it is so simple uh that ecology and women uh, are connected and it explains that uh, uh, the, the gender issues in a much wider perspective the uh, the attention uh, is given to women uh, and her rights over the land and water for security women uh, they take care of the livestock the food and everything at home so we should we must include men uh, into all those things but since women have a better understanding of livestock food and preservation document education and archiving so women may be given more importance in these kind of things uh, my question goes into the antiquity of women nature association and uh, and then ma'am uh, people are already in order to assure god is a combination can i inter- uh, um, can i tell so, something you know, we have to talk about both men and women together and uh, uh, complete gender study in the beginning itself i, so I said that my gender study is complete only with the study of uh, uh, feminism feminist literary criticism masculinity studies and queer studies the lgbtq so if we study all these things uh, three things together and uh, understand uh, uh, gender then uh, perhaps uh, our understanding of body politics is better and uh, we can create a society where solidarity is the password thank you dr gautam yeah. thanks thanks lot ma'am uh, thank now i am taking uh, i am two three questions yes 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 i am just taking ma'am two three questions but there are so many questions but already it becomes too late they are oh, they are all taking you. you are not at all audible huh? wait uh, am i audible uh no you are not, not audible, audible. hello am i audible to all
एम आई ऑडिबल ओके मैम जस्ट गॉट डिसकनेक्टेड लेट मी Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, हाँ, yes, hello. Yes, हाँ, yes. You, so, I yeah, I could hear you. So I touched somewhere and it got disconnected. Okay, okay, okay. So, ma'am, uh, there are so many questions, but uh, time is not there. So many questions are there. I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm just asking you two, three questions and just be precise, as precise uh, as precise as possible. As possible. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is not the definition of the female body as holy also an instance of body politics yes uh, so uh, that's what the society has uh, created the definition of female body has always been taken uh, from body politics so now body politics is trying to make it bit broader by involving more issues into it by uh, by you know uh, involving socio economic political uh, religious and all those issues into uh, the female body so the body is not exactly the physical body but the metaphoric the emotional body also so that's what body politics emphasizes okay uh, how far do you think that the capitalist consumerism is contributing as a tool of patriarchy in shaping a stereotypical women overpowering the thought process of young women it 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 has been contributing majorly because you know women have been uh, uh, presented as a stereotype uh, and some particular image a specific image has been attributed to women so consumerism has definitely contributed in a negative way and body politics challenges that okay 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 then uh, there is another question mm. why domestic violence act is misusing by people in india the misuse is always there in not just in india but everywhere uh sometimes some people uh, misuse it so the genuine cases uh, of domestic violence are taken less seriously so that misuse has to be stopped it's not just india it has been misused everywhere okay 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 um can male gaze be a part of body politics yes can male gaze be a part yes, of body, body politics, politics problematizes that but i yeah of course so i did not talk about it because one of your sessions was completely about male gaze but body yes. politics also problematizes that so a woman stereotypes herself or uh, she is forced to stereotype herself through male gaze that has to be stopped one need not be perfect in her body isn't it okay okay uh, how does body politics operate with respect to pedagogical practices especially in lesser literature meant for children okay in children's literature you know uh, from yes. childhood as i already told you that i attended a meeting where in the textbook uh, all the uh, boys were presented in a different way playing archery playing cricket and girls were presented helping the mother in the kitchen body politics starts from there so we should revise our textbooks the illustrations in the textbooks and we should in, in introduce feminist linguistics even in the school books okay 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 um can partition literature like amrita pritam spinger be cited as an example of body politics at play and the women's body as a site for violence perpetrated in the name of patriarchal honor and nationalism yes it's one of the very good examples okay okay 
um, the very nature culture discourse that makes men the hierarchical superior is used in feminist eco criticism by the feminist themselves even the feminine a creature is tagged as more expressive and less rational by new feminist uh, reinstating the body mind paradigm how do we read such dichotomies <laughs> Yeah, I think I concluded with this statement that uh, yeah. women have better understanding of uh, livestock, preservation, food, and uh, household. Women have better understanding and knowledge. And now it's time for women to train their men, their boys, their children, especially their male children, uh, to be equally participants uh, in the preservation and the livestock, livestock, so that you know, uh, women should not only be the preservers in the house, rather men can also equally contribute. and uh, i feel uh, it's unfortunate that female patriarchy has been very much there and these things have been encouraged at home girls okay, are sent okay. more to the kitchen than boys okay so with this i am concluding and i am telling that ma'am you talks about the concept of body politics and explain how the body is so central and yet so invisible in development in theory and practice and you rightly points out that um, it's a way to challenge mainstream development also and reclaim the body as a subject of political power and contestation in development and in this context um, context Ma'am, I would like to personally thank you for your wonderful presentation. And judging from the comments of those who attended, it seems that the fourth day also seems to be very successful. And most of the credit goes to you and others who gave such interesting presentation. And in ma'am, we hope that to you for inviting me. <laughs> and ma'am, we hope that you will uh, want to be involved in our future initiatives. And we are pleased to have your participation in this seven-day international level online faculty development program on gender sensitization. And I personally thank you for your valuable contribution. Thanks a lot. Thank thanks for being here. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gautam, and thanks to all participants. Thank you. Yes. Thanks to all participants. Sir. Good time. Okay. So thanks to all the participants and uh, that that assignment links I have uh, a link I have already shared in the YouTube um, uh, chat box. You can download it and you can also um, then answer all the questions and send it. And I am looking forward to your active participation uh, in this in the fifth day. And that will be, will again start from six pm till then. Good night. Stay safe. and stay healthy thanks a lot man thanks for being bye 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 bye, bye.